for a prize. I, I know. I, it's just, seven. I know. Okay, we have seven. We have seven board members in the room. Let's go ahead and get started, please. Okay. Um, thank you to everyone who is present with us here today. Um, Ms. Pekarski and I would like to uh, welcome you to our first um, open public uh, board session for this uh, fiscal 24 budget process. So this is the first of many, many meetings that we will be having over the next several months. And uh, we look forward to these discussions. Uh, our meeting today is in two parts. This morning, we will have a fiscal forecast presentation from staff um, on our finance team. And then um, we will limit our questions this morning, our comments this morning, to uh, specific questions for staff around the uh, fiscal forecast presentation that they're making. We will take a break for lunch. And then um, after lunch, we will get into a, a more in-depth discussion on um, overall strategic ideas for um, direction that we would like to give the superintendent to start our FY24 um, budget process. So board members, if you can keep that in mind as you listen to the presentation today, um, that would be very helpful. We'll talk further this afternoon about um, you know, how we're tying our budget process to the strategic plan uh, process that we are running in parallel this year. So we'll deal with that after lunch. So with that, um, I will also be taking notes um, as each board member um, does make comments, um, as we did last year through our budget process, so that we can um, you know, track all of these conversations throughout the entire budget process. So um, with that, I will turn it over to our uh, financial staff. Excuse me, oh, Ms. Tolan. Oh, 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 thank you. Thank you for the reminder. Um, before we get going, we have some um, housekeeping things to take care of. Um, one, we need to certify our closed meeting that we had this morning. So let me read that uh, motion. In order to comply with Section 2.2-3712D of the Code of Virginia, it is necessary for the board to certify that since the Fairfax County School Board Since the Fairfax County School Board convened a closed meeting on October 11th, 2022, to the best of each member's knowledge, only public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements and only such public business matters as were identified in the motion convening the closed meeting were heard, discussed, or considered by the board during the closed meeting. Do I have some Melanie Marin and seconded by uh, Ms. Bakarski? Um, board members, can we vote on that, please? Okay, I see uh, Mr. Frisch, Sriracha Slice for Heiser, Ms. Marin, Ms. Colbert Sanders, are you voting yes? Thank you. T Ms. Koufax, Ms. Bakarski, Ms. Tolan, Ms. Amish, Ms. McLaughlin, Ms. Cohen, and Dr. Anderson. That motion passes. Okay, in addition, today, uh, we, Ms. Sizer Heiser, Mr. Frisch, Ms. Keys Gamara, and Dr. Anderson have submitted written requests to virtually attend today's session. All those in favor of approving those requests? Okay, that is unanimous for those of us in the room, so that is passed. Okay, and with those housekeeping items, um, we can move on to our presentation. Thank you, Ms. Burden. Um, good morning. If you can go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, in order to begin the 24 budget development process, a preliminary fiscal forecast is uh, presented to the school operating fund. I mean, uh, for the school operating fund is presented to the school board. And this includes projections in key financial areas, but it's important to note that this is a very early preliminary fiscal forecast that is prepared in conjunction with the county um, for discussion at the joint school board and board of supervisors meeting on November 22nd. Next slide. Um, as you all know, the Virginia Code mandates that it's the duty of the superintendent to prepare a needs-based budget. 
Um, so these numbers again reflect preliminary broad estimates and are, il and are to illustrate potential expenditures, but that should not be interpreted as a recommended change to the budget for fiscal 24. The superintendent's proposed budget comes out uh, um, early January, um, so the numbers will most certainly change between now and then. We there are a lot of you know missing data that we typically don't have at this time of year, um, so we always you know rely on what we do have. But we will get all kinds of things along the way that will refine the numbers. If you can go to the next slide, um, as always, we we talk about the increases in the budget. And on the revenue projection, we're expecting uh, 56.3 million. That's largely um, based on the state budget. Um, we also, the expenditure projections have been categorized into compensation, required adjustments, multi-year investments, and identified investments. So that the total expenditure projection of 238 million offset by the additional state revenue so that the the projected gap is 177.4 million or that would be the increase that we requested from the county so moving to the next chart of revenue projections um, again this is just increases so the beginning balance um, set aside for fiscal 24 is exactly same, the same as the beginning balance set aside for fiscal 23 so there's no increase there uh, the county transfers there is zero um, at this point in time, and as well uh, with the November 22nd joint meeting, we don't project county transfer for, for this particular exercise. Um, that comes about much later in the year, um, and of course is done by the county. State revenue, we're using the um, second year of the biennium budget that was approved last spring, and we're slated to get 55.3 million more. But again, we have a new administration. We, there could be many things that change um, that would impact that number um, over the next couple of months. Federal revenue, we expect that to be level. And then Fairfax City um, is expected to go up about a million dollars. So again, our total revenue increase at this point in time is about 56.3 million. Next slide. Um, as far as expenditure projections go, um, compensation, we have included steps for eligible employees and the average percentage increase of those is 2.22% at a cost of 56.7 million. Um, we've also included a 3% market scale adjustment and the cost of that is 78.5 million. And these two items combined total 5.22%, which as you know, the state included uh, in both years of the biennium, a 5% increase but the state does not cover very much of um, Fairfax's state share, so that generally speaking, for every, uh, every 1% of salary, it's about 25 million and the state kicks in 5 million and 20 million falls to the locals. Um, we also have some benefit changes, um, but only in the retirement area. Um, the ERFC um, contribution rate is going down slightly but the FCERS rate is going up slightly, and so those two items combined uh, result in a net increase of 1.7 million. Um, VRS rates are typically disclosed um, with the governor's introduced budget in December, so for now, the VRS rates are the same as they were in fiscal 23, but that, that again may change. We've also included a market comparative placeholder. Um, as you know, our HR department does um, cyclical salary scale analysis, and there's always um, you know, recommendations to ensure that we're competitive um, that require additional funds, and so we have a small placeholder to be able to address those. And then the base savings, which is the recurring savings due to position turnover, um, is expected to be about 25.4 million, so that the total compensation or salaries and benefits alone is an increase of 113.5 million. Uh, next slide. The required adjustments are um, items that we know we are going to have to address in fiscal 24. Uh, enrollment is one of those. Projections are not completed at this point, but we do anticipate that enrollment is going to come in higher. Um, so that we, for now we're using a 2,000 student placeholder at a cost of 28.7 million, but that will be adjusted based on um, the actual uh, forecast from the planning department. 
uh, contractual increases are cost ex escalation, uh, maintenance and license increases for things like major IT projects, building leases, utilities, those kinds of items. And then transfer to other funds, um, these are pretty routine things, an equipment transfer um, for, that's based on the timing when capital uh, improvement projects are completed. So that's about, one, two, three, four, five, about seven schools that, that will get some equipment funding, uh, all elementary at 1.3 million. Major maintenance uh, of 3.6 million. That also is a, a standard transfer that we do. Recall that the major maintenance funding was cut many years ago with the promise that we would include it in the next year at 3.6 million to bring them to the 10 million that they had had historically. Uh, and, and we've allocated additional funds at year end. Those are one-time funds, so not recurring. Um, moving to the next slide, uh, multi-year investments. Uh, you should be familiar with all of these. There's the HR technology infrastructure project that is in year two. Um, the current HR system was implemented over 20 years ago and relies on a number of ad hoc databases for support and reporting. Um, this funding will support an updated and fully automated work system to support core operations. The Joint Environmental Initiatives, or JET, is in year two, and that's $3.7 million to, um, you know, fund the carbon neutrality, um, bus cost share, uh, get to green, um, a variety of things, and this is year two of, of that initiative. The Advanced Academic Program, um, this is in its final year of the phase in, and it's funding of $1.4 million, or 13.5 uh, positions, um, in total, 9.5 at the uh, at 19 elementary schools to create a full-time advanced academic uh, resource teacher, and four AART positions uh, to provide a 0.5 position at eight middle schools, and that'll be completed in fiscal 24. Special education elementary teacher leader contract length. Um, now, this is not the special ed um, contracts. This is the number of days for the special ed lead teachers. Um, in fiscal 23, um, when that was um, proposed as an increase in the budget, the, it, in the budget it was based on a 195 day contract, but really those staff members need to work um, 209 days. So in fiscal 23, um, that additional, those additional days are being covered with IDEA funding. It's my understanding that that won't be possible in fiscal 24, so we will need to build that into the base um, for fiscal 24. And then there's the innovation project at Lewis High School that's in year two. They were funded at $400,000 in fiscal 23. That was half of what they had requested. And so the other half is, is being identified in fiscal 24. And that is, you know, provides additional sections um, and those sorts of items. Um, it's not really an academy, but kind of a mini version of that. So that's the, the final year of, of that project, or at least for now. If you can go to the next slide. There are um, identified investments on um, page nine, and that includes the equitable access to literacy plan for language arts basal resources for all students in support of the, the division's plan. Um, at 30 million, this number is soft. We do need to do some more analysis on that number. Um, so that is certainly a number that will, that will change um, in the coming months. Cybersecurity, um, that is, uh, you know, something that it has been on our radar for the last couple of years now, and we would like to implement a proactive framework-based approach to cybersecurity, and we need $10 million to be able to do that. The superintendent's strategic reserve um, is set at $6 million, and that is to address unforeseen division-wide needs. And then FCPS on pre-K-2 um, is, is $5 million. And you may or may not recall that when FCPS on was originally envisioned, it did not include devices for um, PK2 students. And, um, but, you know, the pandemic changed all that. And we were able to access a grant to get devices for those students. But as a result, there are a, a larger number of T-specs that are needed because the T-specs in the schools 
um, are now supporting 40,000 more students' devices than they were um, prior to implementation of PK2. And one of the items on um, the technology folks' agenda is to reduce that T-spec staffing standard from 0.5 for every elementary school and one T-spec for uh, greater than 750 students to lower that so that one T-spec would be allocated for every uh, elementary school that was over 600. So that results in about 22 positions, 22 additional T-specs, as well as some uh, licensing software costs that, um, that we, will, we will have to address as a result of uh, providing devices for, for that population. So again, in summary, right now, the best number we have is an additional 56.3 million for revenue. Um, I've gone over the major categories and the, the gap would be 177.4. We also thought it would be, in, you'd, next slide please, um, that you would be interested in knowing about the um, items that you know, we're currently doing um, as part of the post-COVID recovery and that's continued use of the um, MTSS framework to make decisions based on data, to provide differentiated academic behavior and social emotional wellness supports for all students, um, use of high leverage evidence-based academic and wellness practices, academic intervention supports to include summer learning, on-demand tutoring, credit recovery, school-based opportunities within and outside this school day, Wellness supports to include expanded use of SEL screeners, development of wellness models, central office collaboration teams to support division instructional priorities, and then ongoing family engagement opportunities. We also have a few varieties, next slide, um, that are not included at this point in time, and that is expansion of the early childhood program, uh, some initiatives to support the math curriculum, and then, of course, additional cybersecurity needs. And that is it for the fiscal forecast. I tried to go fast because I knew you all were running behind. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Burden. Okay, we see um, several school board members already have their hands raised for um, specific questions on this presentation. Ms. Corbett Sanders. Yes, and I probably will need to go back. Um, so essentially, what you're suggesting is that with all of the um, expectations, we're talking about three cents on the tax rate, unless we see uh, continued extraordinary um, supports or extraordinary changes uh, to the property values, which would then realize a higher tax uh, base than expected. Um, so I guess my question is, do we have any idea of what the current expectation is on the increase in property values in Fairfax County? No, we don't, we don't have any information from the county. You all may recall that typically we do this presentation in early November in preparation for the joint meeting in November. Um, we're doing it much earlier this year, and so as a result, we don't have any information from the county about what they're thinking or any cost estimates as far as their, or what their revenue looks like. We just don't have any of that information right now. So that actually provides a bit of a challenge for all of us, but I appreciate you being frank about that um, because the county does uh, provide almost 70% of our total funding in our budget. And so we are dependent on that information to determine how we, um, how we prioritize. Secondly, on contractual increases, um, wondering, does your contractual increases take into account the fluctuation in fuel rates? Stop. One more time. Yes, there is some, there is some inflation built in um, for fuel uh, in that category. Excellent. Um, you also have a very big ticket item on equitable access to literacy, which is different than what we had seen earlier. It would be helpful to have a full and robust project management plan of exactly why $30 million is needed for this compared to um, what we had been told prior to this. Yeah, I mean, anytime, most times, when you see a, a flat number that's $30 million, 
that's a placeholder. We do not have any analysis or calculations that go along with that. It's just really early in the process. Um, but I'm sure that that's something that the instructional folks will, will be providing, you know, if this makes it into the superintendent's proposed budget in January. Okay, thank you. And I would note that my time has been clicking throughout or continuing downward while uh, you spoke. So if you could add back um, that time, that would be great. Um, my next question is regarding the uh, placeholder of uh, $10 million for cybersecurity investments. I actually think that that is a very reasonable investment. I ran the numbers. It's about $47 per student and staff member. And so how does that compare in best practices for other educational institutions? I'm going to have to phone a friend and ask Mr. Sethi if he would address that. I can certainly um, talk a little bit about the practice and the, the team that we're building and the resources. Um, the intent is to start adding capacity and grow so there is a longer term plan which will come along which has future growth in terms of the resources that are added in to keep expanding the cybersecurity footprint and getting additional resources. When we look in the Webby districts on their investments in cybersecurity, I think we'll be trailblazing here uh, when we get to done this, this request. So I appreciate that, but I actually need an actual plan before I would invest support yep. this. I think the $47 from corporate America would say that's a reasonable investment, but I can't give you that uh, that affirmation until I see more of a plan on that because, um, you know, the, the nuts and bolts are what we're looking for. Um, additionally, we see $6 million in a strategic reserve for the superintendent. Uh, in addition to the strategic, the uh, budget that the superintendent already has on discretion, discre discretionary issues. I'm a little surprised by this because um, that's what the school board reserve is supposed to do, is uh, contribute to that area. So how do you, you know, how is the oversight of that $6 million going to take place and why is that different than the school board reserve? I can answer that. Currently, um, all money other than the three million has been allocated upon my arrival. So, in terms of my discretion, um, I only have discretion over the three million that uh, is in the reserve that we're utilizing for strategic planning and so forth at this time. Given that we have a strategic plan in process this year, so it's a bit of a gap year. I want to make sure we have some set aside that isn't fully allocated that might be utilized to be responsive to the goals that we identify and our action plans connected to the strategic plan moving forward. I appreciate that, um, but then what you're saying is three million you currently have and you want an additional six million to make nine million? No, the three million is for this year, fiscal 22-23 or this 22-23 school year. We're talking about next year's budget. No, I understand that, but I think you already have some money, so I think it's right. going to be... That's one-time funds. That was funded with your end. Okay, so... It, it wasn't in the operating budget, so my understanding was one time, one and done was the three, so... Okay. I think that it's an opportunity to put it in the general fund budget so that if we begin work around the strategic plan that that work would be sustainable. It's not a total of nine, in my understanding, it's six. Okay, I think we are going to probably have to unpack that a little, but I appreciate where you're coming from on that. Well, and in percentage terms, the three million this year is less than zero. It's almost zero percent of the budget, actually, of the overall budget. No, I understand that. Um, I guess my question is, aren't there other aspects where there's discretion to the superintendent? It's not like you don't have discretion elsewhere in your budget, and if, if people haven't shared that with you, then I think we need to make sure that that's shared with you. Yeah, no, I've been, um, it's been clear that all monies have been allocated. Thank you. Uh, we can appreciate it. Okay, Megan. 
I want to thank Ms. Corbett Sanders because you captured a lot of my questions, so you're going to give me time for, for other comments. Um, you know, I think the thing, my colleagues, that I struggle with the most is that it is my understanding that the county executive and the board of supervisors um, wanted to move away from this annual, you know, chicken little concern of how much money we'd have for county government services, school system services, and so they were doing projections not on an annual basis, but on you know a two-year lookout, three-year lookout. And so, um, Dr. Reed, since it's our first time working with you on the budget, um, I I, I want to start at the most macro level possible. We're making projections on what we think will come from the state. It is not helpful to the board, to you, to the public, if we don't at least have an initial conversation with the chair or the board of supervisors and the county executive to just say, what has, where are you on your, your fiscal forecast for the county? The, every year when we meet with them in November, they'll say, our outlook for the next year or two is the following. So I completely appreciate, Ms. Burden, that you know they're not going to have hard numbers, but they do say to us, and I mean, I've actually had conversations with them already where they said, we're anticipating it could be you know, a 2% growth. So while this will all change over time, and I really appreciate that we're doing this sooner, very much appreciate it, but I've never been comfortable when we have a zero on what funding we're getting from the county. It just creates this $177 million gap, and that puts the, the community in a panic, our employees in a panic. I, I, I would like everybody to kind of think about how that um, continues to be an issue there. Um, Mr. Sethi, I really appreciate that you are helping to innovate what we do in Fairfax County um, when it comes to information technology. Um, and I do think that it will help us as a board, especially if we're going to be trailblazers um, among the Wavy uh, schools, the Washington Area Boards of Education, um, that we might be able to get a little more details on that. But I, I support that in general. Dr. Reed, you know, the school board does have its annual. Um, eight million in our in our reserves. So if we don't have that for the superintendent, um, I think that's a conversation we should be having. Um, and I really want to emphasize what um, Ms. Corbett Sanders said with a lot of these big ticket items. I just want to have sort of a breakdown of where these, you know, how these funds are being allocated. This board deeply believes in the literacy program we adopted. But we also need to understand what $30 million is doing with it. Because great programs with good intentions, but we don't know how it's being deployed, we still have that responsibility. And I'll need to go back. Can I Thank just, you. Can I just add one small clarification on the, the literacy placeholder? That largely is the anticipated budget to do the K through 6 language arts core uh, instructional materials adoption. Remember, we went through the adoption process with an estimated budget of about $26 million last year, and we suspended the process because the state passed the Virginia Literacy Act, um, and VDOE is going to release um, a list of resources that we can uh, purchase from. They've yet to do that, so this is really largely that money to make that curriculum materials purchase, which we haven't done for 20 years in Fairfax at the elementary level. And, and that's probably the number one thing we could have just led with, that we're looking at a $30 million yeah. adoption. That's awesome. Yeah. Thank yeah. you, Sloan. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Ms. Cohen? Thank you, and thanks, guys, for the work that you always do. To I'm so grateful that we start this as early as we do. Um, a few initial questions. We had had conversations pretty robustly about the need to keep the extended contracts for all of our SPED staff. And I don't see that reflected unless we're saying that's um, coming from the special ed audit. No, that is not included in this preliminary uh, fiscal forecast. I mean, I, I would just argue, and I guess I'd ask my colleagues to um, give their feedback as well. But we've continued to hear that the extension of that, which we've been able to do the last two years with ESSER, well, year-ish with ESSER money, 
um, has been pretty life-changing for our special ed teachers, still does not remotely capture the amount of time that they spend um, on IEPs and other paperwork and all of that, but it's a start. And so I, I just, I can't imagine us passing a budget without ensuring that we keep those extended contracts. Um, I, I could not support that. Um, another piece too, I don't see anything in here. We had a follow on motion where we were gonna look at the dri bus driver finance tech food service and IA salaries. Um, is that captured in, in this piece? Um, yeah, that's what I was talking about on page six, the market comparative placeholder, and that is just placeholder funding to address any um, market comparisons that we do um, for salary scale, you know, um, salaries. So we, I know that they're looking at a number of things. Those may very well be the ones that they're looking at, and we just have a placeholder because anytime we look at those, we generally need to make some improvements. Okay. And I guess I would just say that to my colleagues as well. I know many of us have had conversations um, about maintenance and facilities as well and trying to look outside of what necessarily the WABY guide is, but also trying to compare it to um, industry and looking at how and where we're losing folks from. So um, I certainly am hopeful that, that we're gonna be able to address it, that in this budget. Um, you know, I, feel like I'm beating a dead horse here, but um, not a fan, of course, of providing devices for pre-K to two. I know that's no shock to any of you. Um, but I, I do, though, um, agree that our T-spec ratio is certainly off, um, and I'm supportive of that. Um, with that conversation, though, what's, is there a further need for additional ESPITs who are doing that training um, to help support our teachers on how to use and implement devices because they feel, it feels to me like they're stretched incredibly thin as well. Um, n no changes to the ESPITS uh, staffing standard have been conveyed to me. Um, I'm sure Mr. Sethi may have a different idea about that, or Sloan maybe. <gasps> Yeah, I mean, I think the, the fiscal forecast exercise is always really difficult because you're looking across the entire school system to try to determine what the priorities are, understanding that, you know, you've got a fixed amount of potential new uh, revenue. So the ESPITs, I appreciate you raising up the workload concerns because they're significant as we've added devices, um, and T-SPECs need to support those devices. ESPITs need to support the students that are using those devices. So, you know, Additional support there would be welcome, but when we built the fiscal forecast, again, looking at the priorities of things that we needed to address, um, that one didn't make the initial list of recommendations. I guess I would just say to Dr. Reed and to my colleagues, you know, when we look at the, our sort of strategic planning, I mean, maybe we need to have a more comprehensive look of this next year's budget is going to be all things IT and what are the whole pieces of it. It's cybersecurity, it's training, it's resources, it's, and really make, I feel like we just chip away little bit at little bit. And so we try to, and I think sometimes we create additional problems like FCPS on, look, here's a grant, this is great, let's get our kids these devices. And then now we need several million dollars worth of additional staffing to support it which is totally reasonable, but how do we, how, you know, how are we making those investments in a much more holistic way, getting it at, um, at some of the problems? So anyway, it's my initial two cents. Ms. Cohen, I just wanna make one quick comment on that, and that is primarily why we have the afternoon structured the way that we do, is to try to parallel the strategic planning process with those big picture looks. Thank you. Ms. Marin. Thank you. I also had additional questions about the uh, equitable access to literacy plans. So Ms. Burden and Dr. Presidio, you started to answer some of those, but really what I want to understand is what are the resources? Are we talking about things or are we talking about people and training for people? Textbooks. Yeah, this is this is really a budget for curriculum materials and supplies, i.e. textbooks. You know, some of those resources would be digital, likely. Um, you know, some would be class sets of instructional materials, decodable text for the primary grades, 
comprehensive K-6 language arts adoption. There will be professional development as part of that from the publisher um, to train on the materials and to provide support for staff to understand how to you know, access and use all the materials effectively and efficiently. But these are not these are not funds for you know new positions, reading coaches, anything like that. It's really materials. Okay, so that I, I would like to learn more about that, and it connects with some of the other things being said. Um, I mean, I'm aware, isn't it, that every elementary teacher got I think hundreds of decodable books. Yeah, we did because again we delayed the, the, the adoption. Gap. We did purchase but, some some amount of decodable text. Yes. Yeah, I, I just. Um, well, let me carry, thank you. Let me carry on with the next piece, which again relates to, are we talking about things or are we talking about people? So the ESPITs, yes, we have devices, but are the ESPITs or teachers teaching our children how to use the apps and the tools on the devices? Because I've recently been aware of a lot of um, instances in students that I represent where they're not maximizing yet the use of these tools, and people don't even know who to ask, like especially in middle school or high school. So I'd like to broaden the conversation from, it's not that ESPITs just need to manage the hardware and the software, but who is actually educating our students on how to use these tools, including teaching our students typing. So I don't know that I, well, I would like, the, the question I'd like is, when it comes to some of these You know, if we look at, as Ms. Cohen was kind of trying to frame up the technology funding, what about that again is about the people, not just the hardware management? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Let me just pull up the, for FCPS on, well, we have, that's the pre-K initiative, but is that just devices or does that include again similar to my last question training on using the devices having the teachers understand how to teach especially young children the devices it, it's 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 both it's 22 um, positions dropping that staffing standard from 750 to 600 would mm -hmm. result in a need for 22 additional positions and then there's also a professional development included in that number as well as licensing software Okay, so it's a that's helpful, yeah. I mean, I think, as Ms. McLaughlin said, too, I would appreciate just more drilling down of what these big buckets are. Um, Ms. Burden, you had mentioned that there wasn't a change in um, benefits. I think you mentioned retirement, but I know something's changed with the health care options, the plans. Can you just talk about that? I believe there was a study, and just talk us through that, please. Well, we, have not, we do not have uh, an increase in health care included in this preliminary fiscal forecast. Again, it's preliminary, it's very early. We, you know, if I had my way, well, <laughs> it's very early. These numbers are, are soft. Um, and right now we are not predicting an increase in contribution rates uh, for healthcare in fiscal 24. But, you know, that is going to be dependent somewhat on um, participation and enrollment. Mm -hmm. Um, and so we won't know that until after open enrollment in, uh, concludes mid-November. Well, and then of course it'll take them a while to, you know, to, to see the impact of those changes. Um, so for now, we are not seeing an increase in healthcare, but in the superintendent's proposed budget in January, we may very well see an increase because we'll know more um, by the time we get there. Okay, thanks for sharing, and you have um, informed us already about the increasing cost of health care as well as the increasing cost of utilities. So I just wanted to get a handle on that. And I also want to voice that I support the placeholder for compensation for our instructional aides, for our operational staff. So I really think we need to make some, some movement there. Thank you. Dr. Anderson, followed by Ms. Somesh. Um, thank you, and thank you as well for this information. Um, just kind of pulling back a little bit um, in, in term and looking at this a little bit more globally, I would love to get a sense of um, from what you just talked about, Dr. Presidio, where you said some things were considered 
but did not make the list of priorities. I would love to get a sense of that because maybe those are the very things that I might be bringing up as a school board member. Um, so I wonder, is there a space for you all to kind of open the curtain a little bit to share with us? How did you arrive to the to the um, expenditures that you put before us? Well, the majority of the, the line items are based on the best information that we have right now. So, for example, step increases, you know, the baseline budget always starts out every year with we take all of the employees that are current and on board and move them forward on their step and what is the cost of that. And, of course, their salary sensitive benefit changes as a result of that. Um, you know, like I said, some of the numbers, like the equitable literacy, is uh, it's a placeholder. It's just something on our radar. The cybersecurity, you know, at 10 million, that too, that number could go up or come down. Uh, enrollment is based on 2,000 additional kids, and so we take the um, actual enrollment that we have right now. We add 2,000 kids and calculate how much staffing we would need as a result of that. And apparently, we need 28.7 million more dollars of staffing based on that increase and the distribution based on what we're seeing currently. But all that will change. All that will change based on. Right. And I think I have a good sense, Ms. Burden, in terms of what has made the list. I guess I, I would just like to have a little bit more information on what didn't make the list and why did they not, why were they not considered top priority? Um, so that's the piece that I'd like to kind of have everybody sit with a little bit. But I'm going to go on since my time is going on a little bit. I would also like the opportunity for you to kind of show the breadcrumbs a little. Ms. Cohen talked about, oh, we had these follow-on motions, and you showed where they were embedded uh, in one of the placeholders. It would make so much sense for me for you to say this is why. Just kind of connecting the prior board's work, I mean, the board's work, the board's prior work to what you have going on right now. And also, I'd like to also get a sense of when you are having this conversation of priorities, what conversations are you having with repurposing resources? Because we all speak about this. When something goes into the budget, it never comes out. How are we evaluating that all of the things on which we're spending money continue to be the things on which we need to spend money? I, I, I want to hear a little bit more there. So I'll take a pause and hear from staff. Well, we did include three items um, that were priorities but were not funded early childhood expansion, math curriculum initiatives, and then, of course, additional cybersecurity needs. But we are at the very beginning of the process. I mean, this the fiscal forecast that is before you is largely um, a finance exercise. Um, there is not, I mean, we're just too early in the process for to be gathering information from, you know, the, the leadership team, the superintendent's cabinet, um, we're we're not there yet. That that is later in the process. Um, it's 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 a finance exercise based on the best information we have right now. I got it. So I will look forward to having some of those um, issues that I have raised show up later on in the budget process. Um, but also just to kind of share what my thinking is on this, and this is for Dr. Reed and everyone else. Just overall, when we're determining what we need to spend our money on, I would like to get a good sense that we are spending and allocating resources where the needs are. I, I don't think I've had that sense so far where we are needs-based and we have transparent formulas, whether it be for staffing, whether it be for allocation of various resources. So I'd like to make sure that we're being intentional about that. And also, Ms. Agatum, as we're talking about IT, I'm mean, sorry, Mr. Sethi, as we're talking about IT, I would like for consideration for family engagement that speaks to our families with low literacy. We've talked about this with Dr. Reed and Ms. Um, Lloyd a little bit over email, but I'd like to get a sense of how are we exploring opportunities for our families to get access to our very urgent messaging that are, that are not just relying on the written word. So it could also be translated in the multiple languages that we know we need in Fairfax County. And lastly, I would like for us to give a sense of the advanced academics investment that we have. This is the third year. I don't think we have yet a plan on what is our expectation? What are our metrics for success for the significant investment? So I'd like that to be a thought as well. Thank you.
Okay, thank you, Dr. Anderson. I, I'd like some staff feedback to what I have raised. I just stopped okay. because I know my time was up. Ms. Burden or anyone want to take that? Well, I could briefly respond to the advanced academic question. I appreciate you raising that because um, it's an important issue for the division. And, you know, as you'll recall, we had a very comprehensive external study that was done that we received a number of recommendations around. And one was about fidelity of implementation issues and challenges with things like our advanced um, academics curriculum being available to all students in all schools, fidelity of implementation of the Young Scholars model. Um, and following that study, one of the recommendations from the study was to increase our levels of staffing so that uh, we had one advanced academic uh, resource teacher at every elementary school and a .5 at every middle school. Um, so the board did approve uh, a long-term funding strategy to do that. And in the FY24 budget, um, if passed with that included, we would uh, meet that target that the board had set for full-time funding at elementary and half-time funding. Um, at middle school, and I'd be certainly happy to provide more information, but that's just kind of a quick response. In terms of those staff members um, are really working to support integration of the curriculum in, in um, all classrooms, um, fidelity of implementation and support for young scholars, which of course is our talent development program to address some of the diversity challenges um, that we have both in advanced academics and at TJ. Thank you, Dr. Presidio. May I please be added to a go back because I have sure. some additional priorities there. Thank yeah, you. I'll go through everyone. Thank you. So much. Uh, thank you. Actually happy to follow. I support all the points Dr. Anderson raised. Um, thank you staff for always for your hard work. Uh, I, I think the county, I just want to elevate again the county conversations piece. It might be actually fruitful for Dr. Reed to start the, the relationship there um, if that hasn't been, you know, built around the budget. So um, hopefully before our next conversation that, that can occur. Uh, Ms. Burden, I wanted to ask for a little bit of background on how we arrived at the state number just so that we have some context. Um, when the state um, approves their budget in the spring each year, the General Assembly, it's a biennium budget. So it provides uh, funding estimates for fiscal 23 and fiscal 24. This is the current estimate for fiscal 24. Um, that number will change with the governor's introduced budget. It may go up, it may go down. It depends on you know, what, what priorities the governor has. Um, but for now, that's the second year of the biennium that was approved by the General Assembly last fall. I mean, last spring. Okay, no, that's very helpful, thank you. And then we don't have a sense, I guess, of like whether that might go up or down. We don't, too early? Too early, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, I did, just to clarify um, to our meeting managers, I guess talking about budget process is gonna come in the second half of this conversation, things we wanna see changed, right? Yes, yeah. this is questions, yeah, for Seth. Okay, um, I'm also invested in just the, the prioritization question. I understand what you're saying, that this is kinda just what you all are aware of, putting it out there. I want to elevate, you know, Laura Jane mentioned a number of things that I guess we can consider. Um, I know we had placeholders before for interpreters and then ESOL staffing uh, that were recurring. They're meant to be recurring, so I um, just want to make sure those aren't lost in future projections of what might the cost might be. Go ahead. Um, if, it's recur if it was funded with recurring dollars in the previous year's budget, then it is included in the next year's budget. Sorry, it's, um, I guess that's misleading to say recurring. It's, it's an increase every year, right? So it's a gradual increase. It's like a multi-year plan to phase in, like to get to a certain number. Yeah, that hasn't been considered yet. So that is increases to the number of staffing has not been included in this. Okay, yeah, yeah, because yeah. I just want to flag that. Dr. Brabrand had, you know, put that in and I just want to make sure it's reflected. Um, were there not any negative uh, expected projections um, on our end? Oh, you mean reductions to? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, we're, we're not there yet. Um, you know, the, the program managers and um, department heads have been looking at their budget just over the last uh, few weeks. Mm -hmm. um, it's just really early in the process. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm confident that will be um, 
the repurposing of dollars will be part of you know what we ultimately end up with with the superintendent's proposed budget in January, but we're just not there yet. And to follow up, this being so early in the process, it's important for us to hear the board's collective thinking around priorities, so that as we begin to develop the budget, uh, that we can be reflected, or that the budget would reflect what those priorities would be. So, uh, again. This is very early in the process. This is not the budget that we're talking about today. This is that forecast. And, and it is important for us to get a better sense of uh, priorities from the board. Yeah, I mean, I guess as I think about some of the items, for example, with advanced academics, right, we're continuing to phase in an expansion to make sure um, it's available in various schools, et cetera. But then that comes with something else, right? As every school begins to have it, then do we think about um, repurposing funds, rethinking the structure of that countywide, uh, especially in places where we continue to spend quite a bit of money. Similarly with the literacy plan, as we roll that out, I imagine there are going to be things that we're going to no longer practice, right, as we take on new um, practices. So that's just something I assume we, we can project based on what, where the pro project is headed, right? Well, the AART project, as, as Dr. Presidio said, came about as a result of the advisory committee recommendations. Um, and it's in its final year, so it's fully implemented um, in fiscal 24 with this last uh, tranche of funds allocated to that. But you are correct, there could be a decision somewhere uh, between now and January 12th that that was not something that we wanted to, that was a priority. Um, I hate to keep saying I feel like a broken record, but it's just it's too just early. <laughs> very it's too early. Yeah, we we're just not at that point in the process yet. Okay, so I guess to clarify, while we're this early, is the, I'm reading the implication in these slides that we're uh, expecting to be quite off, right, from where what we need and where we're what we're going to get. Is that fair? Uh, typically, this. The fiscal forecast is the highest number we see during the budget process um, because, you know, we refine things along the way and, you know, it's a long time between now and January. Right. Yeah, okay. But our best guess at this point leaves us without enough funds to accomplish all that we've had, we have projected, right? Well, that would require me to speculate what the another group of elected officials might do as far as funding levels, which I try not to do, <laughs> if at all Impossible possible. Impossible to do. <laughs> yeah. Okay, fair enough. And, and I would say, too, as we get further in the process, when we have the joint presentation, when we can put uh, both presentations next to each other, we'll have a much better sense of uh, the county's fiscal forecast, what their numbers are, so that we can have much better and richer conversations about what the this board's priorities are with regard to the school's budget. Yeah. No, I think, colleagues, this just points to, you know, flagging one thing. I mean, in some of the line items, whether it's literacy or advanced academics or a few other things, um, deciding where we are on some of these pieces is going to be important to direct then what resources are required to repurpose or add. Um, we haven't landed on a place uh, on advanced academics as a division. What are we going to do moving forward based on where we've, like now that it's the last year of implementing the recommendations. So based on that decision, staff have to determine the funding. I think that's a conversation we're going to have to have before the end of the budget cycle if we're, you know, serious about what that's going to require. But uh, I'll look forward to discussing more in the next stage of this. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Frisch and Ms. Keys Gamara. Thank you. Um, can we go to slide eight, please? Um, and can you talk a little bit about how we arrived at the $2 million figure for the special education services review placeholder? It, it's just a placeholder. We know that, the, you know, the, the report has um, now been released and that there are some, you know, recommendations about workload uh, as well as staff development and planning and those sorts of things, professional development. And so we know that there are going to be additional costs um, that, that may rise to the level of being funded. And so it's just a placeholder. There's no magic with that number. There's no 
um, calculation behind it. It's just a placeholder because okay. we know we will have to address um, those needs. So for folks who saw the previous work session that heard some talk about a need for basically a three-year plan for implementation, this is not an indication of any thinking as to what that implementation would look like or what would be required in it. It's really just a matter of putting some money aside, even if it's only a fraction of what will eventually be needed. That's correct. Okay. Um, I appreciate that. And I appreciate all the work that's gone into this. I, you know, I think the initial um, instinct for anybody looking at this document is to try and dig into as much detail, <coughs> excuse me, as they can. And that gets difficult because, um, you know, as you've indicated, this is projections based on, you know, experience and best thinking, but those things can obviously change very quickly. Um, so um, I'm comfortable with where we are right now, and I'm sure we'll have further conversations down the road um, about what our priorities are, as we're going to be talking about today. Um, and obviously, we'll have a better sense of things once we know what uh, our friends in Richmond are going to be doing. So thank you. Ms. Kizgamar, go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you. And I really appreciate this opportunity to just kind of have some pre-conversations as to how we're going to go forward. I did look at the objectives of this discussion. And so I'd like to highlight a few things that I think um, if we have that information moving forward, it will help um, us understand as well as the community. Um, I note that the uh, math changes in math are not projected here. Um, as we move forward, it would be helpful to understand exactly uh, not only what that investment could include, but the whys of it, um, just so that the community can understand that additional um, investment. I do agree with Dr. Anderson that we often make um, investments, but we don't always have what I would like to have as a, a complete conversation of, okay, we're continuing to invest and in why or where or why we may need to scale back. Um, the second thing I'd like to highlight is, um, is there a, well, let me ask this. I don't fully understand the process by which we are evaluating our programs and our investments. And so going forward, I would like for, for the community to have that understanding. I know we're not covering that today, um, but there may be some savings, some cost savings in various areas as we redirect ourselves, let's say in, you know, in the, the math area or other areas. Um, so I, I'd like for the community to be able to understand what that means, uh, which brings me to the county. Um, I fully support uh, investments in preschool. I think it is critical um, for our students to have success in K through 12. But our um, assignment, our purview is K through 12. And so I'm hoping that those county conversations can include uh, investments from those other entities that should possibly be carrying that burden. Um, I certainly know that they need our services in terms of teaching um, and, and facilities, um, but I'm not sure that it has to be another line item, or if so, we certainly need to have uh, those fuller discussions. Um, I, I can't see my time. I suspect it's running out. But um, the last thing I will say, we just received uh, reports on all of our schools, all of our regions, and looking at their uh, school improvement plans. So going forward, I think it would be helpful to tie our budget investments, if at all possible or necessary, to those school improvement plans. So I, I think as much information as we can give to the community uh, to understand this process and explain how we arrived at the conclusions we did, uh, the better. And I, again, I can't see my time, but yeah, it's it been done like, for a little bit, Ms. Kizgamara. I was trying to be respectful. You are you. very respectful. Thank you. Um, I'll put you on a go back if you need it. Uh, Ms. Dernak Koufax, followed by Ms. Sizemore Heiser. 
Thank you so much. Um, I do appreciate us starting early. I think that's important. Um, someone who's been here a little while, I, it continues to be unfortunate that our primary funding bodies are not providing more than single year projections for us. Mm -hmm. um, we have, um, we are not in a place right now where we have a good understanding. I simply asked at the beginning of this, I said, do we have, you know, and the conversations are not there. Dr. Reed, I think it is important that with every new superintendent that we have, that you work to establish those relationships and to work to ensure that, um, you know, the more we can understand, the earlier, the better. And if we can do multi-year expectations, that, that would be a great, a better, greater start for us, considering they do provide the majority of our funding for our school system. Um, I do support the compensation uh, for our employees, of course. Um, I see there's enhanced, you know, additional cost of benefits. And as far as when you go the expenditure projections, which we have agreed to, and I'll, and um, you know, um, the special education, we're going to need that from the report. Um, the, the special education's review placeholder, review it from the recommendations, what we'll need to do that. The advanced academic program, and if you recall, we did that over a three-year period. That was to allow equity to find um, the unidentified potential in our uh, English language learners, our ESOL students, um, making certain. And that program um, has shown great results. I think we haven't seen some of the reports because we haven't seen the advanced academic um, you know, report from this year. But I think as a system, what we can do is we can't really talk about just needing to dismantle a program or things like that. We have to look at this. Some of the things we have done in the past have been scattershot, and some of it has been just because of COVID. I mean, we had to do what we had to do. We had a strategic plan. We weren't able to continue along that line, that lineation. And now Dr. Reed has come in strong with her team, making certain that we are going to look at the system holistically, and that is gonna help us as we move forward in the budget, saying these are our priorities as a system. What are the costs going to be to move our system, our staff, and everyone forward? So I get very concerned when we talk about, oh, why are we doing this? Why are we doing that? This was done. This was agreed to. And I think it's important that we continue to move forward. And as we talk strategically about what is best for each and every student, because that is what equity is, providing every student what they need then we can then better go forward as, as, as we move there. So thank you. Thank you. Ms. Sizemore-Heiser. Sorry, struggling to get my video on. I'm not used to being virtual. Um, thank you for that. And I, you know, I, I really appreciate the conversation. And I think um, one of the questions that I had when looking at the material is, I appreciate the expenditure projections on the um, multi-year projects. And I think that you know leads me to sort of lift up the point that Ms. Darnett Koufax made about it. it would be helpful to have multi-year um, expenditure uh, projections so then we can better look when we're um, approving initiatives that are multi-year, we have a better sense of the overall funding for that. But I did have a question in terms of, you have expenditure projections that's uh, listed separately from uh, multi-year expenditures, which is, the literacy, cybersecurity, the strategic reserve, and the FCP is on pre-K to two. Um, I'm just kind of curious how those four were chosen. I know we've obviously made a very strong commitment to our literacy plan, and, and that's a, a big lift for implementing, but it seems like we have other expenditures that we may have projections on, and, and maybe I'm wrong. So I guess I'll pause there and say, how were those four picked or listed here? It's on slide uh, nine. Yeah, the um, the FCPS on pre-K two that is a um, an initiative that has been a part of you know what the the technology folks have been advocating for over the last couple of years. Uh, the superintendent strategic reserve 
that number was uh, is double what it was, um, what it is in fiscal 23, um, and, and provides funding that are recurring funds instead of one-time funds um, to provide some flexibility and to deal with unforeseen division-wide needs. The cybersecurity number, um, you know, that is an estimate um, from the IT folks as to what their needs are, will be in 24 to move forward with their cybersecurity program. And then the equitable access literacy plan, again, that 30 million, that number is uh, pretty soft. Um, and so we're, we're gonna have to do some more analysis um, to, to be able to have, a, it, it will be a different number in the superintendent's proposed budget. I appreciate it. And I guess I wasn't clear in my question. It's not the numbers that you're adding to it, but it seems like there may be other expenditures, right? Um, that we would want to have some idea of in terms of topics. And I bring that up because, I, um, and perhaps is my misunderstanding, my understanding was this was sort of a strategic budget meeting for us to sort of talk through it. And I appreciate our budget chair and vice chair sending us um, some information ahead of time in a Google form to start thinking through sort of that um, priority-based budgeting process, right? And what are our priorities and where we want to focus? And it, I think the slide, at least for me, seemed to state that we're already signaling a direction of priorities that perhaps this board um, for this budget process, you know, needs some more time to talk through. So it, it feels like we, with having this year, we're getting to the discussion of specific um, in specific uh, funding areas where I think the purpose of this was really to talk more broadly about priorities. So, you know, I, I appreciate that these seem to be some priorities we need to work on, and I'm not saying they are or they aren't, um, but I think it, for me, it would be helpful, and I'm looking forward to the second part of this conversation to get a sense from you all, are these the priorities that you think the board should be focused on in addition to what the board thinks are priorities, or are there additional um, identified investments or priorities, um, which is what this states to me, that we may want to consider in that our afternoon conversation. Well, on page 12 are the priorities that are kind of on our radar but aren't included. Um, there hasn't been any costing done, and that's for early childhood, math, and then additional cybersecurity. And that's, that was actually my, my next question, so I'm glad you mentioned that. Are these the only other ones. I'm just, just I'm trying to figure out like, is this a comprehensive list? Is this is where you think your main priorities are? It seems like it's a um just kind of curious how we got to this list as opposed to sort of having the conversation here first and then kind of um, calling a list out of that. These are the items that I know about right now that have risen to the level of of being a potential priority because again. This is very early. Just because it's on this does not mean it will be in the superintendent's proposed budget. Um, all of those decisions about what the priorities are will uh, hopefully come about after the discussion this morning, I mean this afternoon, as well as what the superintendent's priorities are that you know will be revealed um, along the next couple months. Well, I appreciate that, and I just appreciate the chance to really um, dig in this afternoon to how we look at our, our, our priorities as a whole and how that ties to our strategic planning process and our strategic plan. So I appreciate the time. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I think everybody... Oh, Dr. Ivy, go ahead. If I could just add to the conversation. We have been talking about equity, equi equitable access literacy plan since the very beginning of this school year. And so I would say that that is a number one priority. And so I, I, would, I would just say that it, as far as funding, is concerned, it would be a priority. And that is why the, the funds are as such. And I mean, I think it would have to, there would have to be a discussion around how much and further clarification and explanation. And that bears to be, you know, discerned. But as far as this, um, Sizemore Heiser's question to staff around, is it a number one priority? 
Yes, it is. And as far as cybersecurity, and is it a priority of ours and staff? I would say it's on this list because it is for obvious reasons, especially those two. And the superintendent's strategic reserve, yes, that is a priority as well amongst staff. And so in answering those three questions, the, for those three items, the answer is yes. And that is why it's there in answer to her question. Thank you, Dr. Ivy. Um, Ms. Tolan, would you like to go next? I, I don't really have a lot of additional comments. I appreciate um, what my colleagues have brought to bear. Um, I, and again, we're early in the process, so I know we don't have specifics behind the numbers that we're seeing there. Um, that would be my biggest comment as we're moving forward, particularly with uh, changes that we've had to you know, we have a new interim assistant superintendent for facilities and transportation. We have a new assistant superintendent in HR. Um, I'm hoping that, you know, as we move forward, that those people really have an opportunity to take a look at any numbers that we have in there from their departments um, that they, to make sure that they agree with everything. Um, we will be moving forward, and this is a comment more even from my colleagues, as we move forward and for the public, as we move forward with, um, we are getting uh, public input right now on our ESSER um, money and the use of our ESSER money. We will be looking for significant um, public engagement throughout our strategic planning process. This year in particular, I think that we may see some fluidity with some of these items that become priorities in the budget because of the amount of public input and board input that we're getting on this, these big strategic um, uses of funds. So we just need to keep that in mind. Thank you, Ms. Tolan. Um, thank you for this. Thank you for um, the questions and the comments. It is kind of an odd year for us because we've talked about how this is a gap year. We're onboarding Dr. Reed. We're working on the strategic <laughs> plan. We're trying to couple and marry those two together, but they're not 100% because we're in process. So I just want people to remember we're in process. That means doing. So. With the, fall of the fiscal forecast, the ways in which we have done this in the past, when we would get it in November, um, we'd talk about priorities before, then we would get the forecast, then we would go straight into this meeting. So trying to kind of flip that a little bit, um, and it's not perfect this year with the information, but hopefully we'll be refined every year so that we are able to have more information up front with which we are able to um, make decisions and discuss. So while we are undergoing this process, our staff is undergoing this process, the county's undergoing it, and we all kind of have to marry those things together. So um, I know it's a little bit frustrating. It's a chicken or an egg type of situation always every year. Um, but I think it's good that we're starting now. And um, of course, because also Dr. Reed doing this first time with us uh, and giving us as much time as we possibly need to try to set some priorities, knowing that we will have guardrails as time goes on and we will have public input and it may change. So just wanted to say that. Uh, we do have go backs. I'll just go down the list if that's okay with everybody. I think we're doing 90 seconds, Ms. Tolan. Let's okay. Do, let's do 90 seconds. Again, okay. recall oops, that, you know, we have a uh, discussion, uh, you know, more in depth, if you will, this afternoon. Um, so we, and we do want to be able to take a break for lunch and we do have a number of key people that have a hard stop at 3.30, which is where we originally scheduled. So we need to keep that in mind. Yeah, thank you. So really questions to our staff about fiscal forecast and what was on the slides. Um, Ms. Corbett Sanders. Yes, thank you. Um, before I ask my question, I do have a question to uh, the budget chair and vice chair. Are we going to actually issue a resolution as we did last year and as this board approved as part of the process to signal to the superintendent and to the board of supervisors what our priorities are prior to that meeting? 
I appreciate you asking about that. And honestly, we haven't made that decision. I think it worked quite well last year. So um, I'm anxious to see how the discussion goes this afternoon and whether we will do that. So. Well, actually, the board voted that we would start that as part of our process. So I would urge that we do that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my question is, and I very much appreciate what Dr. Ivey said about the full commitment of this board to the science of reading. And I don't think that there is any discussion about us pulling back from that. I think what our questions today are about is if we're doing this and we have the full commitment of this board, which has voted in support of this, um, what aren't we doing so that we can ensure that there is that laser focus on, um, on this activity. I, I don't believe that as part of the budget process. We've uh, identified those things that we wouldn't do. Uh, clearly, this was an opportunity and is an opportunity for the board to share uh, your thoughts and around your priorities uh, so that we can get a better sense as we develop the budget to think about those things that we might stop doing. Okay, I, I just would urge us to have that as part of our discussion because that is certainly something that um, I believe our constituents expect of us, but I also believe that in having that initial conversation with the Board of Supervisors, it is going to be really important that we can have that more informed and nuanced discussion so that we don't get con continuously um, accused of we only build on top of a budget versus being much more strategic in how we do this. I think that as we look at uh, the, we're not aware of the, the county's fiscal forecast, but we can get a sense knowing where we are. And we always know that there are, that at the end of the day, there's a finite pot of resources that uh, we need to use to make our decisions. And so um, we've presented those things that are the addition to the budget uh, and can al always make considerations about those things that we need to stop doing. We were in a meeting today uh, where we had some principals asking, well, if we're going to do this, what would we stop doing? It's, those are conversations that we have often in Fairfax. I know that this board started that conversation during the pandemic to take a look at the rest of the budget. Uh, and so I think that there's an opportunity for us to continue that conversation. I would encourage that because we know that there is fatigue by our employees. And so giving them the grace of knowing that we are doing this in a strategic manner and willing to take other things off their plates is going to be essential. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Corbett Sanders. Um, Ms. McLaughlin, and if board members could also speak to um, what Ms. Corbett Sanders raised about a resolution, uh, that would be great. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I fully support it. And if we already voted to be doing this as an ongoing effort year after year, let's get that clarity. Um, and hopefully it's in our school board minutes. Um, I want to first say, Dr. Ivey, I really appreciate you speaking up. Because one of the things, my colleagues, that is important in these meetings where everybody's multitasking is what we speak and say. Did the superintendent and staff understand what we said? Did we even understand each other? So um, without question, I am proud of our community members, our advocates, and this board for really driving profoundly the importance of improving literacy instruction in this school division. And so um, if we left that impression for Dr. Ivy or anybody, I want to make sure everyone knows there is no deeper commitment that I've ever seen in our board than that. I think it just comes to the question of the clarity so we can say to the Board of Supervisors and to our public, this is how we're going to effectively implement this essential program for our students. And when we can't speak to that, it's when the public says, well, great, you had good intentions, but, you know, what is your rollout? So, um, you know, I, I just wanted to use my 90 seconds, I guess, for that. And then quickly to say, Dr. Reed, I say this every single year, we are one Fairfax, 
and every employee that works for the county government and every employee that works for Fairfax County Schools is part of that one Fairfax family. How we determine the annual cost of living increases have always got to mirror that because everyone works for the taxpayers and those monies and whatever the county executive is gonna forecast and say they can afford, we need to make sure there's parity and equity in that, that our funding will reflect it for us. But we have to understand it is one pot of money and that's why this forecast matters. Um, darn, I really wanted to go back on. The county, I will say, Ms. Darren Koufax, always gives us a forecast for the next year out and we're gonna need Dr. Reed to get clarity from the county executive because I know Thank they told us that this coming fiscal 24 was not gonna be pretty. Thank you, Ms. McLaughlin. That is, that is true. Ms. Cohen, would you like to go back? Sure, yes. yes, I support the idea of a resolution. And I think, I just wanted to clarify, I think what Dr. Anderson was trying to get to, which is as we go through this whole budget process, um, what are the things in this budget that were directed by board in terms of follow-on motions? Um, you know, maybe it's just an asterisk that's like, hey, you guys said that we were supposed to address bus driver, finance, tech, whatever. And what are the things that are staff initiatives or, su or superintendent initi initiatives or department or, in theory, all, all comprehensive? Because I do think, like, some of the $30 million for a literacy piece, um, I think it will be helpful as we work together to figure out what that money looks like of even reflecting back um, to the reports that we all just got about what our scores were for our kids. So, you know, here's the targeted piece that's gonna address the big gap that we saw in this population in X school or X region. It's gonna look differently. I think we're hungry for um, seeing that equity piece and not just the equality piece of like, everybody, you know, gets an iPad. That's a bad joke, but I just mean that. Um, and so, you know, how do we work together? Because maybe that literacy piece also, that $30 million is a part of, hey, we've identified that there are special ed reading resource teachers that we need that's gonna look different. And maybe that's, we're gonna do this differently. So I think we're, you, you guys aren't ready for details, which is 100% understandable. Um, but we're eager, of course, as always, to get our teeth into them. So there's the constant push and pull, and we appreciate your patience with us in, in wanting to dig in. Thank you, Ms. Cohen. Um, Ms. Marin, do you want to go back? Thank you. Dr. Anderson, would you like to go? Yes, I would. I, but before I go ahead and get into my comments, I realized that Mr. Sethi did not respond to the inquiry that I made regarding access to communication um, earlier. Yeah, um, we are actually currently exploring a solution which will allow us to provide that aspect of uh, the problem. I think Dr. Reed had shared with us a couple of weeks ago at this point. There is a design which will allow us to do this without um, additional cost or funding requirements. Um, so give us a couple of more weeks to finalize and we should probably come back and share with you what we have. With that additional cost, that is music to all of our ears. Um, going back a little bit to the advanced academics inquiries that I had earlier, um, Dr. Presidio, yes, we all, I, you know, like all of you, we've all been paying a lot of attention to the recommendation of the um, of the consultants in the advanced um, academic study. But I guess what I'm looking for is to date, we're now moving into year three. What progress are we seeing from these investments? What expectations do we have from these investments? Because I think the goals in the study were pretty high level. What are we putting in terms of interim objectives and interim goals for our staff? So that's the piece that I wanted to make sure that I offered you a little bit more clarity on. No, oh, thank you for that clarification. So, you know, we didn't prepare any, obviously, information on, on that today. But what I can tell you is that the goal one report um, for the board's strategic plan around student success has a number of metrics um, associated with advanced academics, um, equitable access, um, and performance. So the goal one report, ORSI is in the process of uh, finalizing that program evaluation report right now. 
Um, staff will have additional information in there and updates on actions that we've taken with respect to those goals and those metrics. Um, and the board is gonna receive that report, um, I believe, <laughs> and maybe the, the clerk could help me, I don't know. Um, I think mid to late November or early December. So that's, that's on the horizon and I think there'll be a lot more information with respect to some of those questions that you're, that you're asking that we can discuss in more detail then. All right, so I will be patient and wait for that. But along the same veins, I know that last year we had a significant um, investment in tutor.com. I would also like to have that information. How are we seeing that that's working? How many of our students are using it? Because I know we paid for the entire county, but I'm not sure of how many of our students are actually utilizing that resource on a regular basis. And again, because uh, we have community members who are watching, who are saying we're not speaking enough to the academics um, of our work. If we could just kind of elevate that in all of these discussions, I think it would help. It's another way to, like I mentioned before, to show the breadcrumbs, to show how these investments will impact um, students' academic success, even though, it, you know, implicitly we all know it, but we need to be explicit here. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. Um, Ms. Omesh, would you like to go back? Um, the only thing I'll say is I would support the idea of a resolution, but I do want to make sure that uh, we are inclusive of the various pieces and that we have some kind of prioritization mechanism, which I'm hoping to speak to more in the second half. So I just do need to flag that because I know, you know, different things that get repeated and whatnot um, end up landing differently. But thanks. Thank you. Um, Mr. Frisch, would you like a go back? No, I'm, I'm looking forward to the next part of the conversation. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Ms. Keys Gamara, would you like to go back? Just, just quickly, um, moving forward, I, I think a few of my colleagues have echoed this. I will just emphasize data, data, data. The more we can look at what is actually justifying the investment or the actions that we're taking, I think the better off we all will feel. And I know that you know we are in agreement with that, but we haven't always tied our actions either to the strategic plan or school improvement plans or you know specific data. And I think that would be helpful, which means that there should be some measurements in place that we can discuss at a later time. But I will just say data, data, data moving forward is what I will be looking for. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Keys Gamar. I think Dr. Reed is also looking forward to that. Um, Ms. Dernak Koufax. I would like to hear from um, you too um, what your thoughts are on the resolution. Sometimes I find the resolutions, um, or not the resolutions. Um, what are we? Guidance. Well, it wasn't called budget guidance. It was. It was called a. Uh, what? What did you call it, Karen? So, where this came from is that the best practice in all of the neighboring jurisdictions is to issue budget guidance to the superintendent in advance of the superintendent developing their full up budget. And so then once, so that guidance took the, the form of a resolution, which Thank you. took all of it, but it is a best practice that was brought to this board and approved by this board going forward. So sometimes I feel like I, I appreciate that and I know a best practice and I know budget guidance, but when you start forming it into a resolution, sometimes you feel we get boxed in this early on. So I'm, I'm still, uh, you know, I, I'm all for best practice. I'm all for guidance. I don't know if I'm for a formal resolution at this point in the process because of that, because how it uh, could stymie us a little bit. So, and with all due respect to my colleagues, um, other than if I don't have, maybe it'll go back to what Karen just said, data, data, data. If I just hear it's not gonna be as good this year, that, that, that doesn't mean anything to me. But, you know, but I don't have numbers here. I don't know what they are. They're not sitting in front of me. And this is the fiscal forecast. So I think that's important that we have that in front of us because if I just hear oh, it's not as going to be as good as last year and we're not sure where we are, I think that's important that we understand that. So um, we understand that in real terms, in real dollars and real numbers. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Sizemore Heiser. Thank you, and um, 
you know, I, I ran out of time before I could respond to Dr. Ivy, but I don't think I wasn't. And if, if this is what the impression I gave, I apologize, but I wasn't trying to say these aren't priorities or these are, I'm just trying to get a sense when we have a list of a few identified investments sort of in, you know, what's the thought behind it, which I think I'm hearing from some of my colleagues, what's the data, what's the, the why behind that. And I think we all, as Ms. McLaughlin said, are strongly committed to, um, our uh, equal access to literacy plan and the data shows that. But I think when we're looking at, you know, as Ms. Dernick Kofex says, we're looking for a forecast, right? And we're looking at certain items that are identified investments, other ongoing post-COVID recovery, which I'm not quite sure on page 11, whether that's um, continued use of ESSER funding for that. And we still need to have a conversation about those supports um, once our ESSER funding is, is no longer there, or whether that's um, post-COVID recovery that's embedded in our current budget, or I just am not quite sure budgetarily what that means in terms of fiscal forecast. Um, and, and same with the priorities not included. And I just think, you know, to our point, tying these to our bottom line would be helpful when we're getting feedback from our staff to help inform us. The way I see this is these are our staff telling us these are our priorities for you to then discuss alongside your priorities and we come together with a document that... Um, supports both. But dig, you know, digging into a little more what the why is and the reason is important, I think, and it's an important part of this conversation. It doesn't mean people don't support these. So having said that, I would look forward to more information as we go through this process. And I think um, formalized guidance is probably good to the superintendent. I'm not sure the form of that, but I think I do think some formalized guidance would be good once we finish this process with our um, budget chair and vice chair that at this, as they've laid it out for us. And I see my time's up, so I'll stop talking now. Thank you, Ms. Esmer. Heiser. Ms. Tolan, would you like a go? I just want to make a couple of comments. Um, you know, Ms. Koffick says, I don't have an issue with doing a resolution. I, I did not try to relay that. Um, I think we will have an interesting conversation this afternoon. Next week, Tuesday, we have a strategic planning session also. So I'm very curious to keep the conversations going on what comes out of today, what comes out of that process, and how do we want to move forward? If we move forward with the resolution, I think I'm very sensitive to what uh, Mr. Koufax was saying. We don't want to box ourselves in at this point in time, and that was never what the intention of the resolution was last year either. Um, I think we did, um, you know, we had a couple of items in that resolution where we had a very clear explanation from the superintendent later in the year as to why some of those items were not funded. Um, so I think we need to just keep that in mind. If we put together this list as we move forward, we're just asking, you know, this is an item that's important to, you know, the public and to board members. So if it's not funded, why not, you know, as we move forward? It's kind of a, a way to document what we're doing. Okay, thank you. I'll take my go back. Um, I, you know, the reason we're doing this now and in the format in which we are doing it, it is because we'd like to identify some bucket areas of priorities where this board has, as of today, um, to give that guidance to the superintendent. So that is the intention. I don't remember us last year making a blanket commitment to re budget resolutions. Um, uh, you know, going forward, I do not believe that a resolution is the most appropriate way to provide that guidance based on our, um, you know, what is in our governance manual about what constitutes a resolution. So maybe we can discuss that as to um, what manner, because I do agree with you, it has to be some formal process and board statement, um, but maybe not exactly a resolution. So I know you want to, you know, want to go again, Ms. Corbett Sanders. I go ahead. I'm perfectly fine. You, I don't care if you call it a resolution or a guidance document. The point of the issue is that a best practice of governing bodies is to actually lead with what your priorities are. And those priorities defined in a guidance document prior to a budget being presented. Because remember, we issue the guidance. The superintendent makes a recommendation. That's their a proposed budget. We then take ownership of that proposed budget by taking action in the February time frame that says we support or don't support what is proposed by the superintendent. And then based on that, 
Then there's the negotiation essentially with the Board of Supervisors with our final adoption in May. If we do not issue a guidance document prior to that, we as a board do not take ownership of what the priorities are of this board going forward, and our constituents expect us to show what our priorities are. Thank you, Ms. Corbett Sanders. I don't disagree. I too am fine with doing that, not you know in a different manner, and hopefully going forward, that's what the strategic plan will help uh, us with. Um, anyway. I don't disagree. <laughs> I don't disagree. But anyway, it looks like most people are in agreement over that, so we can discuss as to the how we will do that. But this afternoon is 100% devoted to doing that exactly. So, um, Ms. Tolan, you want to close this out? Yes. So um, we've got down um, everyone's comments from uh, on the fiscal forecast. So we will take a uh, break for lunch, and then we will return and have... Um, continued conversations, um, getting us to um, you know what Ms. Cover uh, Sanders is talking about that strategic uh, side of uh, you know guidance. So we will return at one thirty-five mm -hmm. and continue the conversation. Um, okay, school board, we are going to go ahead and um, get started with our afternoon portion of the meeting. Um, we are going to do this meeting in a little bit of a different format, um, but before we get started and I get into that, um, I would like to give Dr. Reed just a couple of minutes um, as our new superintendent to frame for us a little bit along with our strategic planning process um, what kind of um, output from the afternoon would be helpful for her. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Tolan. <clears throat> I think that as, number one, I want to begin by thanking our staff for the work that they've done to put together <clears throat> the documents and frame the conversation. Um, I also want to commend um, the staff. We really had discussed whether or not we were going to seek recommendations from departments and schools. And we agreed to go ahead and do that uh, to the point that you as a board have made, kind of to hear what they really thought might be important moving forward, ideas that we could do if we had the resources and perhaps what should we stop doing um, so that we could do the things maybe people think about moving forward. So what I would say is what would be helpful for me and I think for our staff is to hear what you as a board value, if you will, in sort of large bucket items, not program names or position titles, but kind of the body of work you think about strategically moving forward. In my experience, we had five goals for a strategic plan. We had one around early learning, one around readiness for graduation and beyond. Um, we had one around uh, content achievement so that each and every child made at least a year's growth and more if they started behind. And then a, a goal around innovation um, and forward thinking and critical thinking problem solving skills. So those large bucket areas. So I think it would be helpful for us to hear if you had your thoughts out there in those large bucket areas, what would those be? Uh, because staff have a variety of strategies that might get to accomplishing the large goals you have. 
um, and it's helpful for you to frame that for us so that we can then move forward thinking about what are the trade-offs strategy-wise for us in terms of uh, coming back with a, you know, a draft allocation of resources. I also want to underscore that as we're looking at hiring practices for an example, we have some schools that we know require more support and not necessarily more people, but perhaps more experienced educators or perhaps more um, explicit direct instruction at younger ages or perhaps um, more, uh, I don't know, more isn't always what I want to talk about, but allocating time differently, right? So I really think that needs-based resource allocation also falls into how you view a justice-centered division. And if we're talking about each and every student, we know that our children are not widgets, so that um, there are certain conditions that require us to think about allocating resources differently, perhaps by pyramid, perhaps by district, perhaps by region, however we frame that. Um, and I think that's a really critical part of the conversation. It's not like peanut butter that we smear over everything, right? Like there's some um, contexts that are going to require us to really think differently about what we're doing. So that's how I'd frame it, kind of large goal type uh, direction at this point in the process would be really helpful for us. Thank you, Dr. Reed. Um, so what uh, what we would like to do, um, we do have um, three different areas of the room set up. And so I mentioned to board members that um, as you're working, maybe don't move the boards, there are cameras um, on them so that you know, the public can kind of see what's happening. Um, but if we just look at group one, group two, and group three, um, we do have board members that are virtual. So um, a huge thank you to our um, school board office staff. They have arranged for um, them part to participate in you know, Zoom breakout rooms um, in each of these groups. So everyone also has a, um, a pack of sticky things in front of them so that some tools have been provided. There should be markers at each group. We don't have a lot of time, but what we would like each group to do is, and if, you know, and to figure out what tools are useful for you. So for example, I could see maybe somebody coming to a group saying, hey, you know, I just mentioned this morning, I really feel strongly about the, um, you know, the bus driver salaries, and then we need to be doing something about, you know, bus driver and IA salaries. That would be a specific item you might put on a sticky note, and then your group could kind of look at grouping similar types of comments into something like workforce and compensation as a big kind of bucket area that we would want Dr. Reed and staff to be paying attention to. So if that makes sense, what we'd like to do is um, break into those groups, have those conversations. We'll come back together um, between like 205, 210, and each group can kind of report out um, you know, what their big bucket items look like. Dr. Reed? Yeah, I just wanted to share maybe one more piece. Maybe it's more appropriate yeah. later in the session in terms of how we look at this in a multi-year way. Would you prefer I wait till after we do this first round or? Oh, go ahead. So one of the things that in the division I came from, we generally worked on four-year plans. So what we would characterize, for example, is we might have, um, let's, for ease of explanation, we might pick four big topics. We might say early literacy, we might say competitive salaries, we might say uh, building maintenance, and we might say math initiatives. Let's just pick those four. It could be anything. I don't know what we're going to end up with. But what we would say is, how do we take those four and pace them over four years? For example, if early literacy was a key, we know that's 30 million or 40 million or 28 million or whatever it's going to be, know that we can't do that and math and all of salary in the same year, right? It's like one of those, I don't know, when I was younger, I had those puzzles that you played in the car and you could move the pieces around, but you couldn't move them off the, right? So we have to be able to look at whether it's a four-year, or I would say the duration of our strategic plan upcoming. Mm -hmm. If all of these are important, and often we can say they are equally important, we can't just do them all today. Oh, <laughs> we can't just do them all right now or today, right? So we're going to have to say, 
maybe it's K3 or K2 in early literacy and then 3-5 in year two. So we can do some of math and some salary and some facilities, but we do the bulk of our facility. Do you know what I'm saying? Like we have to think about if we talk about these big topics in isolation, we're going to do it to our detriment because then we're, um, we're not going to be able to do the work in a holistic way that we need to do it. So we have to think about what are the trade-offs that give us a year-to-year -year pacing to still get there. It's a little bit like Jenga, too, I think, if that makes yeah. sense, right? Like, so, so I see Dr. King, because it has to fit. Um, anyhow, so otherwise we'll say, well, we want to do math or we don't want to do literacy, and I think that's problematic. I think that's a really good point, and I think that, you know, we're not going to solve all of that this afternoon if we can come up with some of the lists of the priorities. And then, again, next Tuesday is our next strategic planning meeting. Um, so some of those maybe phasing type discussions will come out of our strategic planning process as well. We're just being very aware of the fact that we are running our budget process this year in parallel with the strategic planning process. And, you know, let's just work together to figure out, um, you know, how we pull all of that together. So with that, um, I will move up to group one. And for those people that are online, yes, Megan. I may ask a process question. Sure. So I'm just trying to understand, um, since the 12 of us have different districts, different perspective, and it, it might have been helpful, at least for me and maybe others, that if Dr. Reed had some sort of framework of what she and the operations team were saying, this is kind of the, the key buckets that we're thinking about, because I, I feel like otherwise we're on a blank slate, and I, I think so, it would have helped us to have a little bit more framework from the people who do the work every day. So I understand your comment. However, I, I feel like the other feeling I was getting from the board was they wanted the blank slate. Like as we're moving forward, what are some of the things that are priorities now? Exactly what it's called, or exactly how they get grouped, I think is going to evolve over time. So I might call something workforce, you might call it compensation, staff might call it something else, but I think if we just have some of these big ideas, this is what we're trying to get at today. Um, I appreciate what you're saying, but I, th I think it's all gonna converge between this week and, and our um, strategic planning meeting next week and as we move forward. I appreciate that. Oops. So let's take a dive in. Um, I'll move up to group one for people online, Dr. Anderson and Mr. Frisch, if you could be in a breakout group one, and I'm just kind of randomly choosing people here, and then I need one other person from the room to move to group one with me. Um, group two, Ms. Pokarski, if you could move to group two, and then um, Karen Keys Gamara from online, if you would uh, log into um, breakout room two. And then breakout room three we'll have over here. And so Karen um, Corbett Sanders graciously offered to help us just with the computer and getting the person online into that breakout room. Um, we'll be here. And Ms. Sizemore Heiser, if you could log into breakout room three. Ms. Tolan, quick, quick question. Yes. Am I supposed to do something or am I going to just be slotted to group one okay, by staff? So you are being assigned. Dense, I mean, if I need to do something logistically is, on my you, computer to get to group one, or will I just find myself in that breakout room? Because I don't see it listed yet. Okay, to join the room, please. Did you hear that? You're going to be assigned no, to the room. And then um, you will be prompted to just hit OK. Thank you. Ms. Marin. Yeah, and I'm excited to do the breakout groups. Thanks for offering that setup. I'm just concerned. I know I have trouble hearing in a crowded room. Um, is it an option, perhaps, so we don't have to try and um, you know, deal with the noise level for our colleagues online? Might they go together in one online room so that we don't have to That's worry about their experience? being um, uh, disrupted. Do you already have them in their breakout rooms? Yes. Okay.
All right, let's give it a try. Okay, so people in the room, you can choose a place to go. I just, uh, just because I see a few faces that seem a little bit confused. So I just want to remind everybody, Ms. Tolan did send an email last week with um, the fact that we're going to break out into groups. You all amongst yourselves are going to talk about priorities, concerns, et cetera. Then, then we will report out as a group, and we will also have an opportunity after that, for each person to individually talk about whatever their personal uh, concerns think, and priorities Barkey, were. It's not that we didn't know until moments before this work session began that five out of the, set, the 12 board members yeah. needed to be virtual. That's It's just a logistics well, thing. It's not because we are complaining about Unf the process you guys set up. I, I agree. Unfortunately, neither did we. So right now we're just trying to do with what we have. And since we have enough, I think they will report out together. And, and I think it'll work out OK. Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. the first time. Yeah. It actually probably worked out better, I think. So yes. One, two, three. OK. Thank you. Okay. It's the first time. We've Go ahead, we've break put up. We've kids and staff through this a million different variations, so we can try it. Go wherever you
Are we good with the sound? Okay, those of you that are virtual, can you give me a, just a hands up if you can hear us? Yep, we got you now. Thank okay, you. Okay, fantastic. All right. Um, so our small group discussions uh, did take as long as we thought they might. So we are at 225. What we would like to do is give each group um, approximately three minutes to report out the key uh, findings, I guess, or key ideas. And then um, we will finish out with an opportunity for each board member to speak um, about the uh, you know, individual ideas, um, priorities, et cetera, so that we can track all of that. And um, I think they can. I was told they could. Can you hear, can you guys, uh, those of you that are online, can you please? I can hear you. Okay. We can hear you. Thank I you. I can hear you. Okay, thank you. I can hear you. Okay. Um, let's. Elaine, we can hear you. <laughs> Elaine, Melanie, can you hear the, they can hear, hear me. <laughs> All right, let's start out, please. Um, well, we'll just go in order. We'll put uh, Ms. Marin on the spot first to um, talk a little bit about some of the discussions in group one, and then we'll move on to group two. So, Okay. All right. Uh, so it was myself, Ms. Tolan, Mr. Frisch, and Dr. Anderson, and the themes that bubbled up, one that seemed to capture a lot was investment. And that really could um, be broken out into money and time. And we talked about maintaining and building and also sunsetting. So, you know, are we doing the cost benefit analyses to see if the programs we have are worth continuing to fund? Um, we talked about retaining staff and compensating staff. That also went to another theme. Um, doing uh, well, again, the cost benefit analysis, kind of like a, a regular program review and then acting on those findings, building year over year. So whether that's student learning, operations, and program building. So Dr. Reed, I have not had the experience of planning more than one year in advance. So I, I welcome the opportunity to do what you suggested um, and have experience with. And the total budget building, so not just tinkering with the you know, $100 million that we're told that we can tinker with, but really what is in this $3 billion budget, and that gets back to the cost benefit and program analysis, and then integrity of implementation as well. Are the programs doing what they're supposed to be doing? If not, what's the problem? How do we fix it? Um, also, building an investment in advocacy for more support, um, whether it's money or time, and uh, whether it's revenue generation as well, locally or at the state, but that is an investment. How do we not only invest in what we're doing, but invest in revenue generation? We have a few programs that do that, but we could be more intentional. And then the um, sustainability, so intentional sustainability building is certainly an investment. Another big topic, especially from Dr. Anderson, um, she um, uh, articulated well, was about resource allocation. And there's a lot of connection there with the workforce compensation, but it's, it's like need-based allocation for real. Like, let's talk about the diversity of funding at the most local, the most student-based point. How do we do real needs-based allocation, including especially the staff piece, staff retention in our most high-need schools? So again, that relates to the workforce comp and the staffing. Um, and then we also talked about, well, I, I talked about access. I saw it as an access piece. So access to instruction and staff meaning small class sizes, enough qualified teachers year over year, access to facilities, access to programs and courses, access to tools like technology or language interpretation, access to safe spaces, access to behavior health programs. So um, we really focus a lot on, on the people portion of what we, we, we do, not so much the curriculum and programming piece, which maybe others did. So investment, access, and resource allocation with a heavy focus on retaining our quality staff. Does that about summarize it? Great, okay. thank you. Thank you. Ms. McLaughlin, were you the group two person? Okay, uh, I'll try this working, okay? All right, so we had touched on three of our goal buckets, uh, the largest one being student success and just running down uh, the list, 
uh, stronger mental health supports for students and staff, greater fidelity for MTSS, uh, and being more inclusive of st uh, students with disabilities needs, um, better quality access uh, for and, and uh, equity across all schools for after school clubs, uh, expanding early childhood education, uh, a targeted effort to close our gaps, um, the uh, developing and ensuring a plan of action for the a the air report, um, improving our best practice delivery for literacy and math, including enabling advanced math access for all students, uh, enhancing non-traditional education models like STEM access, computer science, which is a state goal for all middle and high school students, uh, community schools where we can better co-locate uh, county services and academic supports and services for families, uh, workforce readiness improvements uh, for diverse career pathways, um, under resource stewardship, uh, investing in major maintenance needs, and really examining best practices for 21st century renovation, looking at re, uh, like assessing and potentially re-rating uh, our renovation queue, uh, and also making sure that the board's commitment and the JET commitment of net zero readiness on our renovation projects is that happening, and if not, then what do we need to do as a board and a division um, on that one? And then finally, under Premier Workforce, uh, just our continued commitment on competitive pay, uh, enhanced recruitment and retention, as well as addressing workload concerns of our employees. So Stella and Karen Keys Gamara and Laura Jane Cohn were part of my group. Did I miss anything? Okay, so on to group three. Thanks, Megan, and thank you uh, to both uh, Elaine and Stella, because I really look at this as being the beginning of our more detailed strategic planning process, and I think that's the approach that the um, people on my collaborative team uh, expressed, and on the team were Abrar, Tammy, Rachna, and myself. We broke it out into four specific areas, uh, academics, and supports for those academics, workforce development and retention, uh, facilities and security, and uh, the mental uh, and social emotional well-being of all of our students. Along those lines, under the academics, the focus is on ensuring that the continuum of academics is available to our students, those that need enrichment and acceleration and those that need remediation. So the full continuum um, and to bridge academic gaps and transitions for our highest needs learners. Uh, we need to ensure that we have funding uh, for our special education report and ensure that we have adequate funding for those who required special education services, including those that may need advanced academics. Um, and then adopting inclusion model for our special education students. We have adopted it, but really implementing it with fidelity. Um, addressing the unfinished learning, I think I already said, spoke to. The academic growth and renewal of the FCPS promise of meeting students by name and by need throughout the continuum, and investing in pre-K uh, to ensure that they are ready to learn uh, by the time that they're in kindergarten. Commitments to hands-on learning in both the sciences as well as in math with math manipulatives and ensuring funding for the arts uh, and rebuilding the um, flagship program in Fairfax County of our arts programs. Uh, supporting our academics is uh, the inclusive and uh, a inclusive curriculum, including varied narratives, robust translation and interpretation services, reviewing the ESOL curriculum to decide uh, what investments are effective and those that are not, 
um, and ensuring that we have reasonable staffing ratios, eliminating barriers for families that want to fully participate in Fairfax County's uh, programming, and continue funding of our one-to-one -one tutoring and academic supports. Workforce development, ensuring that um, our most vulnerable workers receive a living wage in the county, ensuring that we have programs focused on the retention and recruitment of the best-in-class educators, competitive pay for all staff, and ensuring that there is professional development, especially in areas such as, no, it's the JEDI. Oh, justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. Um, facilities and security, making sure that we honor the uh, and put the money for safety vestibules in an accelerated manner um, and that we accelerate the review of effectiveness of all of our security installations. Expanding access to social services, including um, uh, nurses, food, uh, healthy food, and MIFIs. Um, ensuring that our, we have fair staffing ratios with a needs-based approach, uh, facilities accommodations that increase the privacies uh, necessary to support all students, um, addressing the middle school start times, looking towards investment in both the FATE uh, land that we need for the FATE uh, CTE houses, as well as, and I forgot to write it down, as well as the acquisition of land for the western side of the county for a high school. Healthier, more inclusive food options, calm spaces and sensory rooms, finding how to put those in our existing facilities, and beautifying all of our schools and making them places that inspire learning and not looking for... <laughs> okay. Uh, and then... The last area is mental and social emotional well-being, including mental health and behavioral health supports, as well as addressing students' anxiety concerns. Counselors, social workers, psychologist um, ratios that are there to fully support our, uh, mul our uh, multiple tiers of support. Uh, middle school SOSAs, emotional, uh, repeated that one and investing, continued investment in tele-mental health services. Um, and across the board, making sure that anything we do is fidelity of, we do it with fidelity of implementation and we are willing to stop things that are no longer necessary to do in Fairfax County Public Schools. So take things off the table. Our group did forget to share out one of the things we initially said, which was middle school start times. Sorry, gotcha. we didn't have it on our second. All right, thank you. We're putting it up. All right, and I, I just want to say I appreciate um, flexibility among my colleagues to uh, try something a little bit new um, to try to get all this information together. What we will do, I will um, take all of these sheets and compile um, all of this information and, and, and re-get it back out to everyone so that um, you have this um, also summarized. So what we would do, uh, like to do at this point, we have just under an hour, um, so we should have time for each board member to have a three minute um, you know, set of comments on uh, where we go from here, anything that was missing um, from your small group discussion that you would like to add, et cetera. So do we have a volunteer to get us started um, to have that go around? Um, as I mentioned earlier, we have some key staff people that need to um, be at a meeting at 3.30. So we definitely have to finish up at 3.30. So with that, Mr. Mesh, if you'd like to start us off. Sure. That would be great. Uh, Thank you. No one else went for it. Um, thank you, and thank you to both of you for facilitating this. I would just suggest we might want to take these actually for next Tuesday uh, or whenever it's scheduled for, right, the strategic planning conversation. A um, couple of things. I, I look forward to hearing from Dr. Reed kind of how she envisions an ideal budget process. There have been a couple components that I've continued to push for, um, you know, and, and it's an opportunity for us to try it alongside the strategic planning. One of those being, of course, the program evaluation piece, which I know many of us spoke to. 
the packet we have that was just sent to us uh, by Rashna has the ROI you know, grid that we can look at as an example. Um, but that's a place where we can start with some of the zero-based budgeting ideas of thinking, you know, what has, hasn't worked and, and moving forward. I think we're all kind of at a consensus on the importance of that. So number one, having a component to the budget process before we even start looking forward to look back. And that might be, you know, near the end of the summer, something like that, um, before we start off the year in, in envisioning a future process. The next component would be a needs assessment process. This, you know, in federal budgeting, this is normal that they, you know, every department has to do their own internal process and then they report to the president, right, on what their needs are. This is a space where we have the same chance rather than coming to a table and thinking from central office, what does, what do needs look like? Let's go real deep and dig and have that be a part of the budgeting process. So maybe right about now, maybe when we start forecasting, just looking at things preliminarily, super early, you know, every uh, school, every department has a chance to do a really deep dive and then report back up and the superintendent ultimately shepherds that uh, in determining kind of what the needs are and what they look like, more than just a public hearing where whoever knows about it already comes out. So that's another component, which leads me to the final one, which is a prioritization process. And I hope that we get to talk about this a little bit more next time, but I would even venture to say, maybe we come up with a formula, or we come up with something where we account for the number of people affected by a program, the success rate of what we've seen, the years maybe that certain area of funding has been neglected, um, the severity of the problem as we see it, its impacts on accreditation, legal and reputational risks, all kinds of stuff. But that will allow us to be as cl a little bit closer to the impossible task of being objective rather than, again, coming together as 12 and just kind of, you know, discussing what we think is most important or what we sense to be most important. And the data, which Karen talked about earlier, will be an essential component of that. But I, I urge my colleagues to just give some thought to rather than just what are we prioritizing, how are we prioritizing? Because it's, it's you know, it's one thing for us 12, again, to come here and do this, but long term, how are we setting up our system for success in a way that does prioritize equity? We have to be thoughtful about uh, how we do that. And it's, it, sometimes it's going to mean that, you know what, I really want to see this thing reflected. But when I do the how of prioritizing and I'm thoughtful about it, I realize that that thing is actually not what's most important for the division as much as I want it. I kind of want us to reach that place. And, I, and I'm hopeful that Tuesday will allow for it. But I hope my colleagues will indulge uh, the attempt to be a little objective and outside of our own uh, <laughs> narrow lens. Thank you. Great. Uh, I want to thank Ms. Omesh for really drilling into how we can just get better at budgeting um, and this process. I want to share with my colleagues, if you may recall, many of you, that every year the Board of Supervisors, when they vote on their annual fiscal budget, they then have a follow-on motion in which they have a shared um, guidance um, for budget priorities to go to the county executive. So. It starts literally, as we always say publicly, oh, the next year's budget starts the, the day after we vote on the upcoming budget. Well, if that's the case, then this way, Dr. Reed, you would hear from us in May. Going forward for next year's budget, here are our key priorities, that, and then you guys can start building on that now versus us having the conversation in the middle of October. Um, so I, I do think that would be helpful. Um, I, I do want to emphasize that um, when I think about ensuring that our public understands this commitment of, to equity, I think people sometimes think that equity is in this tiny little bucket for a certain number of our total student population. And I really want to make sure that our families hear loud and clear. When we say equity of opportunity, we mean for every child... Um, at whatever level of academic needs and supports they need. And that includes our highest achieving students, our twice exceptional students. Um, I really want everyone to know we want this to continue to be a premier school system. Um, when I think about how we need to do things differently, I just want to put front and center at a national level we know community schools work. They absolutely work when you co-locate services for families and so that um, 
when we look at the child and we look at how we, in the time that Ms. Dernak Koufax and I have been on the board, we haven't moved the needle for our, our families in poverty. We really haven't. And you can't, you can't expect to close gaps when you have families that don't have the resources for tutoring, don't have necessarily the, the level of academic supports in the home to help those students. And so I feel like even looking at the national uh, landscape, Fairfax County is not in a bubble, but we, we haven't found the, the 21st century approach to making that work. I absolutely am very committed to early childhood education. Um, the successful children and youth policy team, known as SKIPT, was founded on two principles. One, student discipline in our juvenile justice system, and the second one was early childhood. So that remains a key priority of expansion. It is done in county partnership, but it needs to get done, and we need to recommit this coming year. Thank you, Ms. McLaughlin. Dr. Anderson. Thank you. I'm a little slow in getting to the button. I will be very brief because I think both uh, Ms. McLaughlin and Ms. Omesh captured much of what, what, what I wanted to share. But the one piece that I do want to underscore, well, actually two, two pieces that, uh, of information that I want to underscore is how do we make our decisions and prioritize? I think Ms. Omesh captured it very, very well. I feel that we're put in the position when it comes to this work of the budget and the CIP work where it's just how do we jockey for position to get what our community is saying um, that we're representing needs. And yes, that is our job, but it also continues to pigeonhole us into a space where I, I believe this is Dr. Reed's phrase, where we're not behaving like a school system, but a system of schools. So we've got these individual needs but how does that fall in the priority list for the entire division? I would love some energy and time to be devoted to that decision making. So I don't always feel as if we are all jockeying for um, crumbs, you know, right now. And as we've done every single year that I've been on the board, we have worked with about $100 million. It's a $3.4 billion budget. And yet we don't have the capacity, the time, the, the effort to really dig down into the rest of that budget. That's the bulk of the money. If we're not really looking into that, we're doing ourselves a disservice by just wrestling with this $100 million that we do every single year. And most importantly, I, I appreciate what Ms. Omej said in terms of having departments you know, share what's important to them and having that be funneled up, but that also has to be transparently presented, not just to us, but also to the public. Because I always hear these conversations are taking place, but I don't get a good sense of it. And I definitely know that our public does not get a good sense of it. So I would definitely would want to hear how are we communicating what the experts who are our practitioners, Dr. Reed and her team, leadership and directors and principals, how are they saying that, what are they saying and how are they communicating what they need to move their schools forward in a manner that is open to the entire public? And I also want to echo that one point that Ms. Um, McLaughlin shared, how are we addressing our students of poverty? That is a third of Fairfax County public school students. There's a great need for us to place our um, significant energy and effort there. And so I'd like to hear a little bit more intentionality around that. But overall, I do want to say thank you very much for this process, um, Elaine and, and team. I've appreciated the opportunity to participate in the small group. But I am looking to hear when, especially next week, since we're talking about our strategic plan, how are we going to dig into the entirety of the budget rather than just the additions that we're asking for every year? Thank you. Thank you, Karen Corbett-Sanders. Yes, thank you, and thank you for the opportunity. Um, last count, it was 86% of our uh, budget is expended at the school base. And we have typically used expenditures based on a per capita expense with some uh, additional funds for to take into account um, high needs such as poverty or English language learners. 
And then we also, because we believe in investment in our um, some of our highest needs kids that are students with disabilities, we pick up the shortfall that the federal government does not fund us for IDEA or that the federal government does not fund us for impact aid. So what I think is really important today is to take a look at how we do our expenditures and whether or not they are the most effective. Um, and one in which we look at it to focus purely on student success, because last time I checked, our raison d'etre is as a student success organization in academics. And uh, for our kids to succeed academically, they need the social, emotional, and mental well-being supports that many of us have talked about today. I have not seen and have asked for five years on metrics of success for community schools model. And if we were to look at the community schools model, it still needs to show real success because here in Fairfax County, those community schools have not lived up to the potential of what was said about they were going to do. And so I am not willing to divert our interest beyond where they should be, which is on how do we ensure that every child graduates from schools in this county prepared to either succeed in college or to succeed in the workforce and that that should be our focus. And on social services that go beyond that, we should collaborate with the county, but we should be very intentional in how we stay in our lane as an education system. Thank you. Kellen? Thanks, I'm gonna push back a little bit on that. Um, just because I think when listening to all of these, there's so much that's intertwined. Like we try to bucket them, but we know that staff is integral to student success. We know that workload is, is integral to staff success, but then also workload um, certainly works um, in favor of doing things like being able to um, provide more resources with MTSS, provide more um, coverage of after school activities, middle, middle school clubs, things like that. Um, so I do think it'll be interesting, Dr. Reed, in your ability with your pin board to uh, figure out how these things all relate and kind of stack to one another. I think um, there's so much that's interrelated, but where I'd argue about the community schools model um, is that I do think we're missing some real opportunities for reimagining what that looks like. You know, we've had a conversation about mental health supports. Almost everybody listed it on theirs. Um, and so, you know, maybe you have an opportunity to work with the county and be the place that houses um, either, you know, some additional mental health resources that normally are housed somewhere else in the county or um, some public health workers who are potentially could be um, put in some of our schools, especially our schools where we need additional supports. I mean, in, a piece of inclusion where we know that we're struggling a little bit is having those supports in place. So what, what community resources are out there that can come into our facilities and into our, into our schools if we're comprehensively trying to look at the whole child? And I think there's some universal agreement out there that the whole child, you know, academics alone is not gonna decrease those gaps and get kids where we want them to be. So we've talked a lot about trauma-informed education and about trauma-responsive um, practices and how we really unpack what kids are bringing to us that's an impediment to them um, accessing success in academics. So, um, you know, I, I think this will be an interesting experiment. I, I don't think really when you get in, when you dig into it that we're all quite that far from one another, but I do agree. I think we just repurposed like a very heavy strategic plan. Like we're all saying we wanna do everything to Ms. Omesha's point. Um, but one thing, what things build on each other? You know, we know that pre-K leads to much stronger success, much higher reading um, skills and abilities later on. So is that an investment that then is an investment for us later 
um, in school. So I, I, don't, I don't envy your position, but um, it seems clear we kind of want a little bit of everything still. I don't see other board hands up at this point. Do other people want to speak, Ms. Koufax? Thank you. Um, so yeah, this process is interesting and I feel like it was what we had done when we did the strategic plan last time. So it was interesting to do it from the budget perspective and try to, to funnel what this would be, but we ended up still with these kind of big yes. generic buckets as we went through the group, group three was ours right there, Abrar, Karen, uh, Rachna, and me. And it was like, we came up with a lot of similar things because you can see some of the things overlap, but it is still, how do we, and, and we did, the, the one thing I want to say is we did get to that point at one time and then you know, situations changed so we didn't execute on it. But I felt we were on a good road to saying priorities are these and this is why we need them. This is, these are the monies we need to, to fund that. And, you know, I, I don't want to go through the history of it. But for me, some of the things that continue, um, the pre-K situation, when kids come to school ready to learn, that is a no-brainer. Um, we need to continue to work with the county because yes, the county has 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 pre k has pre k classrooms, and we have pre class pre k classrooms, and the funding is braided and it's complicated, and I'm sure you're learning about it here in Virginia, but that that to me is always a priority because you start there, and then they, when they come ready to learn, you have less. There, there's all kinds of benefits, right? Less remediation, less, less uh, you know, uh, behavioral problems, less mental health issues when they come ready to learn in the door. Um, middle school start times, that's another thing that's been carried over. We really need to do that. That's what I feel like. The safety issues, which we talk about, I talked about the vest in mind, I talked about the vestibules and the land um, needed. Um, in um, ESOL, where where are we of those investments? I think that has a long enough time frame now. Where can we look at these? Um, where can we look at the progress made and are the monies being funneled to those curriculum in the right way? Is it is it is it the right curriculum is what I'm asking. Is it the right curriculum? Is it intensive enough? Because I did confer with our instructional services team members. It still takes, you know, three to five years to get those kids up to speed when they come to us. And what if they come to us with teenagers, as teenagers with elementary school education? So that's where I am. Um, and I just think um, it's, it's and, and all the while, we have those big, big buckets of money that we have to ensure that we pay our teachers and our staff adequately. So that's where the, the, the rub comes, right? How do we get all these initiatives done and still be the most competitive out there amongst our Wavy school systems because that's what we as a system have committed to. So it will be an interesting, I, I appreciate the conversation for this and I think this was the right time to start it early like this. So I think this was a good idea and I think it is the perfect um, you know, runway to what we're gonna be doing on Tuesday as far as how we're collectively hearing from each other and thinking. Ms. Heiser. Thank you. Um, and I think, you know, I think the struggle is, you know, I keep calling it this kind of this hybrid year, right? We're doing the strategic um, plan work and we are um, trying to do strategic budgeting work in a way that, um, you know, is aligning with our strategic planning work. We haven't finished the strategic planning work, right? So it's kind of hard to do the alignment while doing the work. And so it's this, it's this year of, of kind of flying the airplane as we're building it. Um, and so, I, one, I really appreciate this this format. I really even even from this virtual seat, I really appreciate the chance to sort of um, drill down and have these conversations as we figure out our priorities. And I think um, where, where I guess I'm struggling, right, is that we want to um, you know do that what they call you know, the the plan, do, study, act model. I think Dr. Reed's mentioned it. I've heard it in other contexts um, in my career, right. And so we're trying to plan based on priorities, but we also have these great needs. Right, and some of those needs, of course, are our priorities are um, reflective of those needs. But how do we 
address certain needs, whether it's needs coming out of COVID, whether it's, it's needs that are longstanding or both, while also budgeting for our priorities. And, I, and they're not mutually exclusive, but it's, it's a struggle. Um, you know, like, for example, I'll say, I think that we need to really be careful looking at our, what makes Fairfax County this great school system and protect those programs, right? Are, are we being inclusive with our special education students? Do we have um, our programs funded the day we need to? Do we have uh, the right supports for our EL students? Do we have um, the needs of our staff and our teachers so we can um, retain them, right? But, you know, what are we doing for all of that? I don't know if I've got a great sense about what of what we're doing do we need to continue do we not need to continue um should we continue what should we add those are the pieces that i think perhaps as the goal reports come we look at the roi we'll know how to make adjustments but right now in this planning process i think trying to figure out how our priorities are reflective of our needs but also reflective of our future and that's where i'm struggling i'm not sure i'm making a lot of sense i think i'm trying to sort of brainstorm as i'm thinking through this um I do think as we build towards our new strategic plan, um, I think it would be great to figure out how our strategic goals drive our budget priorities um, in a way that is, is more than maybe the budget costs kind of put on top of or, or fit into our priorities. Um, having said that, there are definitely some themes coming out of here, and I think we need to figure out how to look at our um, dealing with the impacts of COVID and alongside um, figuring out how to fund um, what we want to do to continue moving our system forward um, while making sure we do that in a way that's inclusive of everybody. So I think we're looking at our special ed. I think we're looking at um, our EL populations. I think we're looking at needs-based resourcing for our, our um, schools. So we have equitable resourcing for our schools. We also look at our programs that we value, like our performing arts, to make sure we're protecting them and we look at how we um, tie this alongside our, our strategic planning process. I'll stop there. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Frisch, would you like an opportunity to speak? Sure, I think a lot of what you know drives my thinking at this point in the budgeting process has been said by others. Um, you know, I think ultimately we're gonna need to have a follow on, I mean, this is, you know, way out there. We're going to need to have a follow-on motion that directs um, some movement here on how we budget that $3 billion um, in advance of the board ever seeing it. Um, you know, year after year, we have this conversation um, about whether or not we're going to actually do something on that front. And by the time we have that conversation, it's too late to do anything um or largely too late to do anything so i'll probably talk to colleagues in in the months ahead as we work on the budget about a follow-on motion that would direct that so that we're not just having a conversation about new monies all, all the time or no monies as the case may, can sometimes be um but um, i think broadly speaking the priorities that i'm interested in have been addressed um, from academic and social emotional supports to um, uh, supporting our educators and staff. Um, you know, I'm encouraged to see some of the investments in our joint environmental task force goals uh, included in the recommendations and um, we can go forward from here. But ultimately, I don't think uh, we are doing ourselves any favors here if um, we're only ever having a discussion about whatever new money we think we can have allocated. Um, you know, I'd like us to base our budgeting decisions based on the needs, um, and based on needs, and um, that includes taking a, a bigger picture um, of, of every dollar that's being spent. Um, and I believe the last time we had a detailed conversation, we were given a binder and told, you know, basically go figure it out for ourselves what we would want to cut, and that's no way to collaborate on a budget. So, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Frisch. Ms. Mirren, you have not had an opportunity to speak, so please take your turn. Thank you. So if this coming budget cycle is to be the segue as we build the strategic plan, then this is what I would love to see happen or a suggestion for people to consider if they'd like to hear my suggestion. Would you like to hear my suggestion? Thank you. So um, I think, you know, we've all talked about the kind of data that we want. 
And we've talked about what's the return on our investment. I think that then right now in this budget cycle, we need to be clear about what exactly we want as far as information. What is the information we want? Do we want to know, you know, how many students are taking some program or the other, or what's the needs-based allocation really need to be in some place? What information do we need to have created this coming year so that next year we can really have the data? I also believe that the information that we need, though, is are those cost-benefit analyses. Are those um, clarity on, on the buckets of funding and how they're, braid to, how they're braided together, whether they're from FCPS or state or federal? A question that perennially comes up is, how does all the funding break apart? So you have, for instance, world language. I'd love to see world language in every elementary school at an appropriate um, level of instruction to make a meaningful difference for students. Right now, we have a wide variety of ways that students have world language in elementary school. How is that funded? What different ways was that, is that being funded? But if the goal is every child gets access to appropriate world language instruction, then we can back map. But again, we need to take some time, and it seems like we will have this year perhaps, to get clarity on all the things that we're funding, because then we can make the actual decisions on what's going to remain and what needs to be sunset. So basically what I'm trying to say is, we use this year to not only create the budget that we will need, but also keep it a little flexible or open so that the strategic plan can, can feed into it. We, as a board, specifically come up with a roster of questions about data that we want to ask and have answered so that it informs next year's process about the whole budget, not just the tinkering around the edges. We ask for, you know, we highlight a few programs, whether it's early childhood or world language or AP, to really get an understanding of how is this funded, how is the funding braided. We know sometimes school staff are paid by central office funds if they're on site a little bit or not. It's, it's very all over the place to me, and so I'd love to know clarity. Where are these things budgeted from? What, what budget lines? And then we as a board make decisions on what remains and what must be sunset. That to me would be a very clean way to do the budget work and make it database. There's my brainstorm thinking for your consideration. Thank you, Ms. Marin. Um, Ms. Karen Keys Gamara, do you have comments? Well, I feel like I emphasized what my priorities were in the previous um, session as well as participating in the group. So I don't feel like I have anything additional. I do look forward to getting the data so that we can make appropriate decisions. And I appreciate the opportunity to hear everybody else's uh, concerns. I realize we're going to have to have some conversations to um, hone that down. I will also say I, I also support something written from the board directing the superintendent with respect to how do we move forward. Um, but I'm not sure that that's what we're focusing on here. I do want to uh, state my support for that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Ms. Pekarski. I don't know that I have anything meaningful to add besides what's been already talked about. I think, you know, to Ms. Marin's point, I don't disagree, and others who have said it, I don't disagree, but I'm very hopeful that those are the things that will come out of the strategic planning um, that we are doing so that we have goals, we have metrics, uh, we are able to look at that document, make decisions um, from it, have the superintendent who comes back and provides that information and her expert opinion as to what she sees as the needs um, as, you know, the instructional leaders of the division, and then we can take that and and move forward. Um, I think it's clear that we all have um, lots of competing <laughs> priorities, and um, to miss to miss. A, 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 at the end of the day, they fall into similar buckets, of course. Um, but to Miss Omesh's point, it's how are we now going to continue this conversation and come together to actually 
prioritize all of these different ideas so that we can provide some kind of written direction because we're clearly nowhere near that right now. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you. Um, so just a couple of comments I might make. Um, I'm even just preparing for today and thinking about overarching, you know, what uh, are we trying to achieve? And, you know, I guess my bottom line is to just try to continually improve the experience of our students. And so, you know, that starts from the very mi minute that they encounter FCPS, whether it's a bus that shows up on time and, you know, gets them to school in a timely fashion. Um, and then, of course, the academics of the day, um, the behavioral health supports, and, um, and students, you know, feeling safe and families feeling that their children are safe in our schools. Um, you know, we've got facilities issues across the county, too. You know, how do we have efficient maintenance um, in those facilities, and how do we have, as people have mentioned, I wholeheartedly support this idea of clear and transparent priorities and criteria um, for measuring those and criteria for prioritizing, um, you know, things that we're doing, whether it's in academics or facilities, et cetera, that are clear and transparent so everyone understands across the whole county how we're coming up with what we're coming up with. Um, my bottom line, though, in looking at all of these different things and talking about all of these things is it boils down to having the best, most experienced and um, educated staff in all of these areas of our school district. So how do we, you know, that's just my, I think, number one priority is how do we really look at retaining and hiring the best staff possible. And so whether it's getting super creative with grow our own programs across facilities, across teaching, um, bus driving, et cetera, um, you know, I really hope that uh, as we budget and move forward that staff will take the opportunity to be really creative in putting together some multi-year programs around all of that. Um, as we said today, all these things are intertwined and um, they all work together. Um, and I so appreciate uh, the board um, taking maybe a little bit of a different approach than we have before and to try to share ideas and, and look into all of this um, because it is an interesting year for the board and with Dr. Reed being here um, and for all of us to try to think as we've said strategically through the, the planning process that we'll be engaged in at the same time that we're doing our budget. So how do we uh, just make sure that we're going back and forth between those um, exercises and making sure that we're you know, setting up the school district for a multi-year uh, successful program. So again, thank you to everyone. Um, Ms. Marin, did you have additional comments? I've got it. Thank you, Ms. Tolan. I, I, oh, um, thank you. Ms. I'm sorry, I miss, misheard. Go on. Oh, okay, sure, thank you. Um, you know, one thing I just wanted to also mention that I couldn't quite fit into one of the strategic land buckets is, like, I would really like our, our students and our staff to enjoy being at school and to enjoy their work and to have joy and to maximize gains. And so I think we can all agree with that. So I don't see it as competing priorities with the budget, just like I try not to see, you know, I only focus on Hunter Mill stuff, you know, because I know all of us care about all the students. So, you know, I, I again, I don't want to approach this as competing priorities. And when we make it data driven, that's when the competition goes away, or at least it's decreased. And so, you know, those data don't lie. The return on investment in education can be identified, even if it's qualitative, even, you know, it can be systemically collected and analyzed. Could we, could I challenge us, each come up with one question that if we could answer the question using data that you believe is already existing, how, if we could answer that question, how would you be able to better create a budget that serves your vision of this system? Could we work on that? You know, and really identify and then ask some of these questions. Um, I just think we have, we all have a similar aspiration, but the staff is looking to us to get specific. And I think if we could say, you know, this is the question. Like for me, like one of them, again, it's world language. You know, what's the return on investment for the different levels? What would it take to expand it? Like show me that data. I know it's gonna be a big complex, messy question. It might take months. 
What would be your messy question? What would it be for early childhood, Ms. Darnack Kofax? What could we do? So, you know, but let's name these things and maybe then as we do strategic planning, maybe the budget staff can answer some of these questions so we can use the data to make the database decisions I know we all want to. Thanks. Thank you. If I can just respond, in 2014, we did a report. So I'm going to send that to you on world languages. I know it's a little dated, but I still want to send it to you. It's an 85-page report. So we did it. And, I want to you know, it we could, I can send it to the board. I'll find it. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, Ms. McLaughlin, do you have additional comments? Um, yes, I do. Um, first of all, I joined the board in my first year and talked about zero-based budgeting. And I want to be pragmatic about how we can approach it because it can be done. We just haven't had leadership that wanted to wrap their arms around it. So, um, Ms. Burden, one thing I would ask that maybe you can comment for um, the audience is we know that there are federal and state minimum you know, requirements that we must deliver. So if we were to start with the 3.3 billion or 3.5, whatever number we're up to now, and say, okay, by federal and state laws, we have to do the following, and th these expenses will automatically be taken from the very beginning. And since we know that so much of it has to do with staffing and, and employee costs, then it can turn out that uh, of 100% of our budget, by federal and state rules of staffing, you will need to have, you know, this many staffing positions, um, and then this is what happens with salary and benefits. So now, here's your next level that you're playing with. Um, and then in terms of, we often get told, well, almost 90% goes to compensation. But the thing is, is not 90% of all those positions our front burner mission critical to what we do. And uh, years and years when some of us would come together and say, this may not be the return on investment we need for mission critical, prior superintendents would say, well, you, you can't make that decision between when I gave you the budget in January and when you're voting in May because that's, that's too late of notice to give employees that we're going to you know, do a reduction in force. And so that's what often makes this so difficult, is we want to be sensitive of every employee who works for FCPS, but the bottom line is every program we run, every position we have is all part of the budget. Um, and then the second thing that I just wanted to add is, we won't have time for this, but because the concerns were legitimately raised about are pilots for our community schools. I did want to reassure everyone here that I am so appreciative of Dr. Presidio and um, our, our staff member, Saray, who've been working to do the board's request, do a deep dive on our pilots, our community school pilots, understand what is the data telling us, also understanding that the pandemic basically put a lot of that on a two-year, like, frozen no progress. So, but they've got a really great report to come back to the board. I'm so appreciative that they heard us loud and clear and have something really great to deliver the board. They're just waiting to get on the queue for a work session. And I'm going to make my plug now that the sooner the better to get that on the queue for our chair and vice chair, because every year that we put off doing it right and doing it well means we're failing to serve our children and families most in need. So I understand the concerns on what the pilots have been, but I do believe we have a great proposal for the board's consideration to, to make it better. Thank you. Dr. Anderson? Thank you. I just realized that I forgot to answer a question that was posed earlier regarding the resolution. I failed to speak to it during my turns um, or whatever it is going to be in order to give the superintendent our directions in terms of the board's priorities. I do want to say for everybody that I am in support of that. And um, however that ends up, um, I think you all did a really good job with it last year, capturing everybody's priorities in a manner that seemed um, 
to have uh, been amenable to the entire board. So I'm looking forward to all of you continuing that. And I also want to just underscore what I've heard just a little bit ago. I think Ms. Marin and Ms. McLaughlin made some real good points in terms of how we can start to begin to um, take a bite out of this gigantic elephant, you know, which is our budget. Um, what you said was spot on, uh, Megan, regarding our salaries. Yes, compensation is 90% of our budget. But do we need all of those positions? I think it's digging down into those layers a little bit. That's going to yield us some dividends. So thank you all for sharing your thoughts. And that's it for me. Have a good afternoon. Thank you. Karen Keys Gamara. Okay, thank you. Um, just want to touch on a couple of things. Um, I do think it's important for uh, this conversation to be captured in some way so that the school system of the board can expect a response um, from from our staff and from our superintendent our staff via our superintendent. So I also support um, that that resolution. I, I did emphasize uh, earlier data. I continue to emphasize that, but I also want to provide some parameters around that. And that is historical context is important as we're doing this analysis. What I don't want to get into um, is oftentimes we have smaller groups of students that may be impacted. Um, so it may just on a numbers alone, it may look as though it it's not giving us the bang for the buck. That's not what I'm talking about. That historical context balances out that conversation. So I'm hoping as we go forward um, that we can, we can look at that. Um, I do have a question, and I'm not sure if I, I can't see who's at the table, but is, is Lee Burden still available? Yes, she's here. Okay. I wanted to ask her with respect to zero-based budgeting, if that is considered a best practice for public schools. Well, no, not really. Um, I mean, there are, are some advantages to zero-based budgeting, and there are, are some disadvantages to that. Um, you know, a, a lot of the reasons why school divisions, local governments use uh, incremental budgeting, uh, and basically that's, you know, working around the edges, I guess, instead of looking at, at the whole thing, is because basically that requires that one review the decisions of, you know, years of other elected officials, decisions that those elected officials have made um, historically. Um, Zero-based budgeting is also a somewhat subjective and has a focus on short-term goals instead of long-term goals. Um, it's resource intensive. It requires um, training of managers to be able to do zero-based budgeting and, of course, time to plan. And, um, I guess the last thing is that it, you know, savvy managers can certainly manipulate a zero-based budgeting uh, exercise. Okay. Yeah, and the, so schools, I, the schools are zero-based because we, you know, we don't just take whatever staffing they have and carry that forward over in the next year. We take the enrollment projections and we recalculate everything based on the staffing standards. So the schools are zero-based budgeting. It's the departments that we're not, that we don't do zero-based budgeting with. Okay, I asked that question because I had heard that some years ago that, you know, in the public school arena, that was the approach. So I just wanted to kind of um, clarify what I am supporting. I'm I'm not sure that we fit a pure zero-based um, budgeting model, but I certainly support review of our actions and trying to make sure that we're moving toward continuous improvement and 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 watching where our dollars are. So I guess that's sort of a, a, a hybrid approach. Um, so I, I did, I appreciate that uh, explanation, uh, Ms. Burden. And, you know, as we move forward, we're certainly going to need your help in, in navigating because I think we're all trying to move toward greater accountability, which I think is the appropriate thing. So thank you. Oh, I have one other comment. I'm sorry. Uh, with respect to community schools, I did want to say, I, I know we had one meeting, I believe, a year ago regarding this. 
I would like going forward further explanations as to how these decisions are being made. I don't recall that the school board has been involved uh, in in helping or even um, understanding how these schools are chosen. And as we look at any report, I'm I'm going to also want to know what that overhead is so we can balance that investment against other choices. So thank you. That's my last comment. Karen Carr Sanders. So um, I really appreciate Megan talking about, you know, what are we doing based on the standards of quality? You know, what are we doing in excess of what we are required to do at the state level or the federal level? And I would urge people to please go back to the ERS study that was done a year ago, which clearly states that we um, exceed the SOQs in just about every area, but it says relative to enrollment, we have got a higher comparable, higher overall staffing levels than other large countywide county school divisions at all school levels. The majority of the FCPS incremental investment is in teachers and other instructional and instructional support positions including a lower student to teacher ratio than most of our peer divisions, especially at the secondary school level, and to support teachers' FCPS investments in more coaches and fewer instructional assistants relative to peer divisions. FCPS staff, social emotional specialists, more generously than our peer divisions. This is driven by an implied incremental investment of 275 more counselors and social workers full-time equivalents in Fairfax County, and our psychologist staffing is on par with, our, with peer divisions. Relative to peer divisions, FCPS staffs 115 more school-based clerical positions with more generous staffing in the elementary and high schools, partially offset by lower staffing in middle schools, which we addressed in last year's budget. So I encourage people, and I encourage you, Dr. Reed, if nobody has brought this study to your attention, to relook at this, because I think that that is a very good basis to the beginning of a conversation on how we invest and whether or not we should be investing in certain things and not others. Thank you. Thank you. I think that's an excellent reminder. Um, Mr. McLaughlin, I know you had a concern about whether your question was answered. Does that start to get at it? I think you're looking at if we have the SOQ. Yeah, I had how just. How much are we spending above that? Right. During my turn, I, I specifically looked to Ms. Burden because I wanted to make sure that that I understand from from our prior budget conversations that is that a good way that we could start demonstrating if the if the the board is asking how do we look at how we're allocating our three point three billion dollar budgets, then is your team able to say, okay, look we have to be federally and state compliant. So when we do that, and my team lays out for you, this, this is something, it's a, it's a non-negotiable. You guys will have to keep this in your budget to be state and federally compliant. Now, below the line is where it's not about compliancy, but to what Ms. Corbett Sanders said, we as a division have, to date, invested in these additional positions um, because it's something that we believe is providing a more premier education. Is that something your team can do, and is that the appropriate way to start off with what's state and federally mandated? Well, you know, trying to get a list of what's state and federally mandated is um, very complicated, but we can make assumptions. Um, you know, based on, on the information that we get from them. The staffing standards on the state funding is pretty much, you know, what's required. But there are also things that are a little more uh, nebulous, like it's a state mandate that we have a grievance process. Well, how much does that cost? Well, you know, it's going to, it depends on how many grievances we have, and it's HR is involved, and the superintendent's involved, and so trying to capture what that costs 
when it's something that we're required to do, but being able to point like we do with schools and, you know, we got to have one principal, those kinds of things. It's just a little, it's just a little more challenging. Yeah, I would say central office probably makes it a little more challenging, but Dr. Reed, I would say, and, and to Ms. Burden, let's just start at the school, bu school building level. What do we know that our, our SOQs we've got to have in every school and that you, you can't remove that because then we're not compliant in terms of the... Yeah. Yeah, it's the the ERS report does a really nice job of identifying the oh, okay, where so, we are over right. the SOQ. Okay, so to what Ms. Corbett Sanders said, then again, Dr. Reed, I'll just put it in a follow up email. But what I would like to see is that you and your team create for the board. Then, if we take the ERS report, if you're taking our FY twenty four budget, here is what we no is above the line, we're not gonna be able to eliminate. So then we're not spinning our wheels, the 12 of us, and your time and your team's time on stuff that we really can't touch. And I don't, I, I don't think it's, that part is too complicated in terms of at least what's at the school building level, and then we can figure it out from there. I, I'm just trying to find a starting point because I, I think it doesn't help right. when we just start at 3.3 billion. Thank you, Ms. McLaughlin. All right, we are at 3.30. Ms. Cohn, you have a comment? Yeah, I just wanted to make sure, like, contextualize, though, ERS. I think there were some board members who struggled with some of the things that were in there. So as you read it, I would say we also have a lot of programs that are dissimilar to our neighboring counties that throw off your student-teacher ratio. So enhanced aught classes, um, IDIDS, CAT B, they're... they're the, where the ratio looks like, oh, this is this great ratio where we are 15 students to one teacher, but it's because of all the programming offered in the building. So I just like, I, you know, I feel a need to like stand up a little bit for um, the way that our buildings are staffed. And I would also argue that the counselors and psychologists is so far removed from what the actual best practice recommendation is that it's absurd to even compare that to other <laughs> counties because they're not doing what they should be doing by their kids. And I'll say that 157 times if I need to. So um, I think it's a we got to find some mutual place to start. But I just want us to be careful to say that overstaffing is more complicated than like we're overstaffed. Yeah, right. exactly. All right especially with those closing comments. I think we've done a really good job today of illustrating how um, complicated, intertwined, interwoven, um, dealing with a budget of this size is and the myriad of issues and um, opportunities, let me put it that way, um, that we have as a school district. So welcome, Dr. Reed, um, to FCBS. <laughs> Um, uh, we will take um, the information on the boards here today. I've got uh, taken notes from everyone's conversations, and um, I will do my best to work with Dr. Reed as we prepare for next Tuesday's meeting um, to see what information we can take forward from this as it fits into the plan that she has for our strategic plan, maybe even not even next Tuesday, but moving forward um, as we continue these conversations. So a huge thank you to everyone for your time and um, good thinking today. Uh, we are just at the beginning of a long, thoughtful process. Ms. Bukarski, do you want to add anything? Thank you, everyone. Have a nice afternoon. Thank you.